Everyone knows this story, but the real question is, which version do you know? Did you know that the dark and twisted tale that we've been taught to fear is quite watered down? If you actually looked at the transcripts and records that were kept during this famous experiment, you'd realize that in your quest to satisfy your hunger for darkness, you may have bit off more than you can chew. So let's start from the beginning. In the late 1940s, a Russian research facility kept five volunteers awake for 15 days using a newly developed military-grade gas-based stimulant. The people were prisoners from Moscow's notorious Lefortovo prison. During the experiment, they were kept in one sealed room in order to carefully monitor their oxygen levels so that the gas didn't kill them. High concentrations of the chemical could be immediately toxic if handled incorrectly. This could potentially kill the subjects in a short time, terminating the experiment, so accurate dosage was key. This was a time way before CCTV, so as far as surveillance goes, the facility only had microphones and five-inch thick glass portal-sized windows that peered into the chamber for monitoring purposes. The chamber was stocked with books to read and cots to lay on, but no bedding. The facility also provided running water, a toilet, and enough dried food to last all five test subjects for over one full month. The prisoners were all high-risk offenders deemed enemies of the state during World War II. Two of them were German, two of them were Russian, and one of them was Japanese. They all spoke fairly fluent English. The experiment began and everything went as expected, at least for the first few days. The subjects barely complained about anything and did everything they were instructed to do. Considering the state of the world at the time and the contrasting nationalities of the five men, they all seemed to get along just fine for a little while. They had been promised a pardon of all crimes and freedom if they submitted to the experiment and could stay awake for the full 30 days. A promise that initially instigated enthusiasm, but unbeknownst to the test subjects, held no real return value whatsoever. Regardless of how the experiment concluded, the Russians never intended to free anyone. The subjects' conversations and activities were monitored 24-7 and under constant review. It was noted in the records that on day four, the men began to share tragic and traumatic experiences from their past. It seemed harmless at first, like some kind of relative male bonding experience that was hyped up and heightened by days of chemically induced wakefulness. So the gas continued to flow into the chamber. On day five, the tone of the conversations in the room took a much darker turn as the men began to openly speak about the violent fantasies that they harbored in the shadows of their dark hearts. But over the span of the day, this warped and twisted into disgusting confessions of fetish, abuse, rape, and even endeavors of cannibalistic curiosity. You see, these men were not the innocent test subjects that the original story portrayed, for their admissions of guilt on that fourth day confirmed a shared sickness among them. An incurable sickness that manifested itself inside their minds, steeped in the painful turmoil of others. Innocent others. So, you need not feel bad for these men because I can assure you, they do not deserve your sympathy as you soon will find out. From day five on, the men started exhibiting very strange behavior. This is the point where things got very ugly. Man number one, the Japanese man, shamelessly masturbated viciously as man number two, one of the Germans, recalled the torture and beheading of a young girl at the hands of his platoon. 
a cruel and heinous act that he'd willingly participated in with great joy. He had personally and carefully removed the woman's skin from her entire upper body. It was only after that that he and the entire platoon performed a ritualistic violation of her anatomy. Sick acts that are too unimaginable to ever repeat. When they were done, they covered her in fish guts and maggots before spiking her to the ground on a big wooden swastika near a nesting mound of fire ants. They stirred the ants before leaving what was left of the poor woman to die a devastatingly horrific death. The German smiled and explained, I let her live though, right? The men chuckled. Man number one begged for more when the story was over as he continued to touch himself. It didn't seem to occur to the test subjects that this was disturbing behavior in the slightest. And so the violent shared accounts continued, intensifying as did the Japanese man's efforts to please himself. Man number three and four were former disgraced Russian officers. They told a horrific tale about how they hung a fellow soldier up from ropes attached to trees in the cold Russian woods. He was suspended above a large pot of water that was heated by logwood fire burning beneath it. The soldier was hanging high enough that his feet would never touch the ground, but his legs would dip up to his calves in the boiling water that profusely bubbled beneath him. He couldn't lift his legs forever. The two officers and their squad danced around the man for three nights and sang disturbing songs about the smell of the soldier's cooking flesh. They mercilessly beat him with rods and carved words into his skin before urinating on his wounds. The two officers took great joy in shaving off trimmings of the soldier's boiled tender leg meat each day and force-feeding the man his own flesh. This horror continued until the soldier could chew himself no more. What was left of the soldier was a ghastly sight of a half-boiled, half-frozen human carcass with a belly full of nibbles that had been peeled from its own body. The man's face was stuck in an expression of extreme anguish, his eyes wide and contorted in cold fear. His jaw was twisted and pink juicy bits stained his mouth and teeth. Even in death, his broken body was frozen in pain. A punishment for treason, the Russian officers explained. The Japanese man's shoulder gyrated faster as he sneered with sadistic approval. Man number five, the other German, told the story of how he became addicted to the meat of Chinese children, which he bought on the Japanese black market. Over ten years, his desires for the flesh became so intense that he began to harvest it himself. It was an unapologetic tale of sadism and depravity. The German explained that he had a secret farm below his house where he kept abducted infants. He acquired them as newborns from hospitals. Back then, it was as easy as walking right into the maternity ward and taking them. He raises them down there in his farm. He explained how they live in cages with no clothing and how they're never even taught the most basic human skills. The cages contained buckets of water that he changed weekly and large troughs that he left scrap in for them to eat. You can probably guess where the scrap came from. He called the kids less than cattle and explained that they weren't treated like people at all. Only the taste of their flesh was described as human. He abused and tortured them in every way possible. He believed that keeping them in fear made their meat taste better. Then when the kids are roughly seven years old, or ripe, he butchers them alive, consumes what he considers as the best of the meat, and then sells the rest to a famous local restaurant chain that's known for the highest quality steaks in all of Germany. Steaks that the one and only Der Führer was known to request by name. A sick accomplishment that he took pride in. The German explained that the cattle under his house would most likely be deceased and grotesque by the time the experiment concluded in 30 days. A fact that he took no pleasure in citing. 
He only hoped a couple of the children might have survived on the flesh of the other so that he didn't have to completely start over. This sadistic son of a bitch feared only for the loss of his farm. The horrendous stories continued, as did the Japanese man's act of sexual gratification. By the time he finished, his hand was dripping with blood and his crotch was wet with dark red. He winced as he tucked his member back inside his pants. The next night, on day five, all of the subjects started to exhibit major signs of sleep deprivation and severe psychosis. They still hadn't had any sleep. The men had also completely stopped communicating with each other. Instead, they began cautiously whispering into the microphones and other inanimate objects in the room. No one had even touched the food. All effects of the gas, no doubt. One of the Germans started having a hushed conversation with the front glass porthole. He seemed to be infatuated with it. So much so, that he began to lick the glass all over and moan with pleasure. He spent hours doing this or crying and telling the front porthole window how much he cared about it. He swore he'd do anything to protect it and he would get extremely violent towards anyone who got too close to his window. But for some reason, he despised the porthole window at the back of the room. And I mean he detested it. He firmly believed that the two portholes were having an affair behind his back. A truly strange thing to witness. Later that day, he had an episode where he repeatedly spit on and headbutted the bad porthole for looking at his window. This ended with the German man roaring obscenities at the back porthole before breaking down into a sobbing mess on the floor. He pulled out clumps of his hair and clawed at the veins in his arms until he drew blood. He just kept saying, I'm gonna do it! I'll, I'll fucking... Don't do it! I'll, I'll do it! Hey, don't fucking move that thing over there! I'll fucking do it! I'll, I'll do it, man! I, I will! The Japanese subject began to touch himself again and whisper through gritted, smiling teeth. Do it! End it! Cut it all off! <laughs> his gums were receding away from his teeth. The researchers noted that it was unnatural and abnormal. Man number one had not arrived at the facility like that, so it too was attributed to the gas. The whole sight caused the other German to begin laughing uncontrollably. The laughter soon became contagious as the two Russians joined in followed by the masturbating Japanese man. Before long, all five men were croaking with ridiculously delirious laughter that lasted for hours, non-stop, until visible pink swelling could be seen around the necks of all five subjects. Then on day nine, one of the Russians started a bout of horrible, non-stop, inhuman screaming. He ran the length of the chamber repeatedly yelling at the top of his lungs for three hours straight. He continued attempting to scream, but was only able to produce occasional squeaks. It became clear to the researchers that the man had physically torn his vocal cords. The other men did not react to this at all. They just sat on their cots in a blank, unblinking, trance-like state. They stayed like that for hours until the second of the captives, one of the Russians, started screaming as well. It didn't sound human at all. Before long, both of the Russians and the two German men were all roaring at the top of their voices and sprinting around the room. The Japanese man grinned as he attempted to touch himself, but at that stage, he didn't have much left to touch. The Russians and the Germans tore pages out of the books and smeared feces on them before frantically pasting them over the glass portholes. The second they did this, the screaming promptly ceased, as did the whispering. As a matter of fact, the room became very quiet after that, but the gas continued to flow. Three more days passed. The microphones were kept monitored to make sure they were still working. They were, but still, very little sound was observed coming from the five men in the room. Oxygen consumption levels in the chamber indicated that all five subjects must be alive. In fact, readings determined that oxygen consumption in the room 
was the equivalent of what five people would consume while maintaining a very heavy level of strenuous exercise. It didn't make any sense. On the morning of the 14th day, the researchers did something they weren't supposed to do in order to provoke a response from the captives. They used the intercom in the chamber. They were hoping for a reaction from the five men that they feared were either dead or in a vegetative state. They announced, We're opening the chamber to test the microphones. Step away from the door and lie flat on the floor or you will be shot. Compliance will earn one of you immediate freedom. To everyone's surprise, they heard a raspy voice calmly and quietly respond with, We no longer want to be freed. Debate broke out among the researchers, doctors, and the military forces at the facility. Unable to obtain another response using the intercom, they finally decided to open the door to the chamber at midnight on the 15th day. The chamber was flushed of the stimulant gas and filled with fresh air. Before they could open the door, the three microphones began to pick up voices inside the chamber again. Three of the men began begging and pleading for the gas to be turned back on. They were whimpering like puppies. The chamber door was opened and the researcher sent in soldiers to retrieve the test subjects. Upon entry, the subjects began to scream again louder than ever. But so did the soldiers when they saw what was left inside. Four of the five subjects were still alive, if you could even call the state they were in life. The food rations had not been touched at all. The Japanese man was dead. He dug a hole into himself where his privates used to be and shoved his whole hand in there as far as it would go. There were chunks of meat missing from his thighs and chest that had been stuffed into the drain in the center of the chamber floor. This was blocking the drain, allowing an ankle-deep pool of red, pink, and brown liquid to accumulate. The four surviving test subjects also had large portions of muscle and skin torn away from their bodies. The lacerations on their flesh coupled with the exposed bone at their fingertips indicated that the wounds were self-inflicted by hand, not by teeth, as the researchers initially thought. The abdominal organs below the ribcage of all four surviving men had been removed. Their hearts, lungs, and diaphragms all remained in place. But the skin and most of the muscles attached to the ribs had been ripped off, exposing an empty cavity beneath the rib cage. The removed organs were left completely intact on the ground like artwork. Each subject sat cross-legged next to his display, rocking back and forth, chewing slowly. The men's digestive tracts could be seen working, still digesting what the subjects had consumed. It quickly became apparent that they were digesting their own raw flesh. They'd been eating themselves and the Japanese man for days. Most of the Russian soldiers couldn't bear to witness what was in that room and refused to return to the chamber to remove the surviving test subjects. The four badly deformed men continued to beg to be left in the chamber and demanded that the gas be turned back on. They became extremely fearful of falling asleep. Surprisingly enough, the survivors put up a fierce fight in the process of being removed from the chamber. One of the facility soldiers died from having his throat ripped out via the bone-exposed fingers of one of the subjects. Another was gravely injured by having his testicles bit off and an artery in his leg severed by one of the captive's teeth. In the weeks to come, four other soldiers lost their lives inexplicably and several researchers committed suicide following the incident. Rumors and paranoia of a potential gas leak in the facility were rampant. It seemed no one was getting any sleep after the chamber door had been opened. In the struggle to extract the survivors from the chamber, one of the four living subjects had to be shot dead. The doctors attempted to sedate him, but this proved impossible. He was injected with more than ten times the human dose of a morphine derivative, but he still fought like a cornered, rabid animal. It took fourteen rounds and a final headshot to drop him. Twenty minutes later, his heart stopped beating. 
But even after it stopped, this specific subject continued to beg for more of the gas. Eventually, he fell silent, but he continued to blink and twitch for three hours. The three surviving test subjects were heavily restrained and moved to the medical wing of the facility. The two with intact vocal cords continuously begged for the gas and demanded to be kept awake. The most injured of the three was taken to a surgical operating room. In the process of preparing an attempt to have his organs placed back in his body, they realized that he too was effectively immune to the sedative they gave him. He tirelessly fought back against the restraints, begging for more gas the whole time. The doctors finally injected him with another extremely high dose of the sedative, and finally his eyes fluttered still, his heart stopped, and he was presumed dead. His bowels emptied beneath him, releasing underdigested portions of human body parts, some undoubtedly his own. An autopsy report later found that his blood had triple the normal level of oxygen. His muscles that were still attached to his skeleton were badly torn, and he'd acquired 19 broken bones during his resistance. Most of them were attributed to the force of his own muscles during his struggle. The second restrained survivor's vocal cords had been completely destroyed. He was unable to beg or object to surgery. He reacted by shaking his head violently in disapproval when the anesthetic gas was brought near him. When one of the doctors suggested they try the surgery without anesthetic, the man viciously shook his head in agreement, hissing an airy, Yes! He watched in excitement, breathing heavily, as if in ecstasy during the entire six-hour procedure of replacing his abdominal organs and attempting to cover them with grafts of skin. The surgeon stated repeatedly that it shouldn't be medically possible for the patient to still be alive. But at gunpoint, he was forced to proceed. A terrified nurse that was assisting the surgery stated that the patient smiled at her several times and licked his lips during the procedure. When the surgery ended, the subject looked at the surgeon and began to wheeze loudly. He was attempting to speak. Assuming this must be something important enough to document, the surgeon gave the man a pen and pad so he could write his message. It was simple. In scribbled frantic handwriting on blood-stained paper, it read, Keep cutting. The other two test subjects were given the same surgery, neither with anesthetics, but they had to be injected with a paralytic for the duration of the operation. The surgeon found it impossible to perform the operation without it because they wouldn't stop laughing. The paralytic cleared their system in an abnormally short period of time and, within ten minutes, the subjects were trying to escape their bonds. They were frantically pleading for the stimulant gas from the chamber. The researchers tried questioning the men about their self-inflicted injuries and why they'd hurt themselves. But the men only spoke two words. Gas. Awake. All three subjects' restraints were reinforced. Due to fear of consequence for prematurely halting the failed experiment, the researchers considered euthanizing the survivors. The facility as a whole was facing the wrath of their military benefactors and everyone knew that failure was a death sentence. The commanding officer at the facility suggested putting the men back in the chamber and turning back on the gas. The researchers strongly objected but were quickly overruled. In preparation for being sealed in the chamber again, the subjects were left in their restraints and connected to an EEG monitor. Two of the men stopped struggling the moment they were made aware that they were going back on the gas. The remaining subject, however, wasn't responding to anyone. He was forcibly holding his head off his pillow, blinking rapidly. Researchers were monitoring his brain waves closely. They were normal most of the time, but occasionally they flatlined without warning or discernible pattern. It was as if he was repeatedly snapping in and out of a brain-dead state. On the way back to the chamber, his eyes slipped shut and his head fell to the pillow. That's when his brainwave stopped and he flatlined for the last time. The only remaining subject that could speak begged to be sealed in the chamber immediately. 
His brainwaves showed the same occasional flatlines as the man who'd just died from falling asleep. The commander gave the order to seal the chamber with both subjects inside, as well as two unwilling researchers and a doctor. Before they could close the door, the doctor immediately drew his gun and shot the commander point-blank between the eyes. The two researchers quickly fled the room in horror as the door slammed shut, locking the doctor inside with the two remaining subjects and the dead body of the commander. He knew he was doomed. The doctor turned the gun on the voiceless subject and shot him twice in the head. As the subject flatlined, he exhaled, hissing unnaturally long for several minutes. The doctor cried as he turned his gun on the last captive who was still restrained to his bed. Other personnel in the facility turned up the mics and gathered around the chamber porthole windows in silent terror as they watched in disbelief. This was wrong! We, we were wrong! I, I was wrong! You were all wrong! But, but we continued and we said nothing! We turned monsters into demons as we became monsters ourselves! He screamed at the observers. As he turned his head to the final abomination that he had helped create, he whispered, What are you? What is it you see? The subject smiled. Have you forgotten so easily? We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at every moment in your deepest instinctual mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are who you hide from others. The third face you show no one, only unleashed. We are what you sedate into darkness when you go to the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. We are no sleep. <laughs> the doctor aimed his shaking, loaded hand at the subject's head and fired the gun. The EEG flatlined and the last of the five men was dead. It was over. Looking around the room at all the eyes watching from the windows, the doctor knew what he had to do. He put the barrel of the gun inside his mouth, pointed it upwards to be sure, and he pulled the trigger. The next thing he heard was the sound of a click and the gas being turned on inside the chamber. The gas being turned on inside the chest and I had not inside. Creepy Pasta Horror Stories I Was Never Allowed in My Uncle's Shop by Mr. Black Pasta. I was never allowed in my uncle's shop. It's where he kept all his power tools and blades and nails and ropes and extension cords and screwdrivers and duct tape and aerosol-based stuff like spray paint and lacquer. I was never supposed to go in there. And it wasn't a big shop. It was about the size of two standard living room areas. It was mainly made of wood with a big metal door on the front. There weren't any windows and it was pretty damn well insulated because when he was working in there, I rarely heard a sound. Unless he was running the table saw, but even then, that was muffled at most. My Uncle Barry was a talented architect. He could build anything, and he made a decent living from it too. But for some reason, he liked living on his land and in his trailer near the outskirts of Jonesboro, Arkansas. Now. We're not talking about your trashy eight mile kind of trailer or even a trailer park. Nope, not at all. My uncle's pad was nice and homely, inside and out. It was a very welcoming place full of backgammon matches and the distant smell of two fingers tequila gold, but that's another story. Still, with all that land he had, I always wondered why he didn't just design and build his own house. I guess he had everything he wanted in that trailer underneath the pine trees on that old private gravel dirt road. My mother and I lived in a house that my uncle owned that was right next to his trailer. Growing up, Uncle Barry was the father I never had, but, but not in a weird way. I mean, he was my father figure and his son Greg was just like a brother to me. 
we were all each other had, and I guess that just made us close. But to my knowledge, neither I or my cousin had ever been inside my uncle's shop. We used to theorize about what Uncle Barry did in there. When Greg was around seven years old, he used to think maybe his dad was a spy. I was about six at the time, and I'd say maybe Uncle Barry was secretly helping make toys for Santa to give to kids on Christmas. Greg would say, that's still a spy, dude. He kind of had a point. I'd ask my mom what Uncle Barry did in that shop, but she never could tell me. She wasn't allowed in there either. No one was. Definitely working for Santa, I'd convince myself. As I got a little older, I started to get more and more curious about the shop. My mother and Greg and pretty much everyone else accepted the fact that the shop was simply Uncle Barry's personal space and no one questioned it. They just let him be. They figured he gave enough to those around him to be afforded a small space for just him. But I was the youngest and addicted to my curiosity. Sometimes I'd wait outside the shop's metal door until my uncle would come out. When he did, he was always sweating and a little out of breath. Sometimes he'd be covered in oil and paint and other stuff too. But he'd always smile and say something like, What's up, dude? And wink at me underneath his protective glasses before locking the shop's deadbolt. I could never catch a glimpse of what was in there. It was too dark and the door was never open long enough for me to really fixate on anything. Well, time to wash up, he'd normally say with a chuckle as he headed back into the trailer. You know, I never saw him carry anything in or out of the shop. I was only ever told by my mom and Greg that Uncle Barry kept his tools in there, and apart from that and hearing the muffled sound of the table saw in operation, I had nothing, and I hated it. Uncle Barry loved to drink Zimas, and when he drank, he'd cook. He normally made a shit ton of burgers for everyone that was around. There was always too much meat left over for us to get through, so my dog Sam was always well fed. Uncle Barry had a big chest freezer full of meat. All kinds, deer, pork, beef, chicken, fish, even alligator. So I was told. I'm fairly positive I never had alligator. But I never really questioned the food I was given. My uncle went through a lot of girlfriends. Mom always said he picked the wrong ones. No matter how long he was with them, in the end, they'd disappear and he'd go right back to Danielle the same day. Danielle was nice to me. I was always thrilled to see her again. She was a nurse. She was the only one who wasn't after my uncle's money and the only one who didn't try to change him. He liked his land, he liked his home, and he liked his shop. Danielle was the only one that was ever allowed in my uncle's shop. My bedroom window held a solid view of the shop's metal door. Some Saturday nights, when Danielle and Uncle Barry would come home late, I could hear them giggling and getting playful with each other. I'd peek out my window to see them cautiously looking around before unlocking the shop door and quickly disappearing inside. This happened quite a lot. I just figured that they weren't ready for bed and didn't want to wake up Greg. But all that changed one night when I was 11 and I heard a heart-stopping scream right outside my window. My eyes shot wide open. I wasn't sure what I heard at that point. I knew I could have been dreaming, but it didn't feel like a dream. Then I heard it again. It sounded like a woman. I jumped out of bed and crept over to look out my bedroom window, just in time to see the shop door slam shut across the dark street. I was wide awake. I put on some clothes, opened the window, popped out the screen, and crawled out into the cold night. When I was about to cross the street, I saw Danielle walk around the side of the shop. She looked a little tipsy. I was surprised to see her there. At this time, Danielle and Uncle Barry had broken up as far as I knew. I ducked behind a pine tree and watched as she unlocked the shop door, hiccuped, and then stumbled inside, gently shutting the door behind her. I waited a few seconds and tiptoed over to the door. I could hear laughing male and female, but 
I figured they were just hanging out, drinking, maybe smoking pot, you know, that sort of stuff. I was just about to call it a night when I heard whimpering. Muffled whimpering was coming through the door. I put my ear to the door. I could hear a female crying. I hoped they weren't fighting again. Shut up. I'm getting tired of it. It gets old real fast. I heard my Uncle Barry's voice demand, then more muffled crying, only this time it was super intense, like someone was in pain. I heard what sounded like an electric drill going for about a minute or so, then some loud knocking and something that sounded like a blowtorch, I don't know. Then, the table saw. What the fuck was he making in there? It looks amazing! It's exactly how I pictured it, Barry. How long will it last? I heard Danielle ask. Should last a while if you take care of it. I was careful this time. Uncle Barry replied. Oh, I just love it. Danielle said. <laughs> well, I love you. Uncle Barry chirped. At that moment, the door started to open. I dashed around the side of the shop in the shadows. Uncle Barry and Danielle drunkenly stumbled out of the shop. Uncle Barry locked the door while Danielle giggled and proceeded to get a little playful with my uncle as she pushed him up against the front wall of the shop and kissed him. You're drunk, she told my uncle, sticking her hand down the front of his pants. So are you, he whispered through a smile. She leaned into his ear and said, Let's go do something about it. Before literally leading him back inside the trailer by his, well, you know what she found in his pants. I came out of hiding and walked back over to the shop door. I pressed my ear against the cold metal to listen again. I couldn't hear anything. I grabbed the doorknob to check and see if it was definitely locked and, to my surprise, Danielle had left the keys in the lock. I checked over my shoulder before slowly unlocking the door and entering Uncle Barry's lightless shop for the first time in my entire life. I closed the door behind me. The atmosphere inside the shop felt musky and warm. It smelled horrible in there, like oil, human excrement, and rot. I nearly threw up as I searched for a light, but there was nothing on the wall as far as switches go. I fumbled around in the pitch black, searching for a cord or something so I could turn on the light, and finally, I found it. I pulled the cord and saw my uncle's shop for the first time. It was a mess. On the right was a wall of tools, but they didn't look normal. Most of them were strange and surgical looking. The blowtorch was up there too. This was not the stuff you build a house with. Definitely not tools for helping Santa either. The table saw was just under the odd set of tools too, but it had a large weird metal device attached to it. There were Velcro arm, leg, and head restraints on the metal device that my brain couldn't make heads or tails of. Fresh blood and fleshy bits of something were still dripping off the table saw and falling onto the sheet of plastic underneath it. I wanted to wake up. I wanted to die. I wasn't sure if I was even breathing anymore. Who were these people I called family and what were they doing in the shop? At that moment, I noticed a tarp in the corner of the room. It moved. I wanted to run. I was afraid it was a monster or something. I wouldn't have been surprised at that stage. I was about to run away and pretend I never saw anything, you know, just, just get out of there and away from that place, away from my family, but the tarp twitched again. Help me. It whimpered. It wasn't a monster. It was someone. I cautiously moved towards the tarp and then slowly pulled it off. The scene was unimaginable. I fell back on my ass and held my breath so long and hard that I nearly passed out. I was in shock. Sitting before me, strapped by the waist to a dentist-type chair, was a badly mangled human being. Help me, please. Kill me. It whispered. It was a woman's voice. But what I saw before me 
did not appear to be the whole woman. Her arms were gone. And where they should have been was nothing more than Velcro pads that appeared to have been melted into the side of her shoulders. That must have been what the blowtorch was for. Her legs had been hacked off below the knees and her hands were sewn onto the bottom of them. The hands were swollen and blue. Blood still seeped out of the stitching and dripped to the plastic underneath her. She urinated herself as she sat there. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was worse than a monster. But her head was the most disgusting and horrible thing I'd ever seen. Her face had been cut off and sewn back on upside down. She was breathing through her eye holes. I could see her teeth through them. Drool and blood leaked through them both. Her eyelids fluttered in and out every time she took a shallow breath. They made horribly disgusting sounds that I'll never forget. Both of her eyes had been pried from their sockets and now dangled out from between her lips. Screws had been drilled into her forehead to the left and right of the mouth which pulled the lips up into a smile. The eyes still moved. Kill me! She whimpered again. I stood up to my feet. I couldn't speak. I couldn't feel the ground. I didn't even know who I was. I didn't know anything. I was scared. I was shocked. I was numb. Do her a favor, I heard a voice say. I spun around to face the door. It was Uncle Barry. Danielle was with him. The expressions on their faces were blank. Uncle Barry turned around and locked the door. It's okay. You can do it. She wants you to. Danielle said with a gentle smile as she took a swig of fireball straight out of the bottle. What have you done? I whispered. Artwork? A hobby? Fun? Hell, we don't know, but we like doing it. You want to try? Uncle Barry asked, passing me Danielle's bottle of fireball. I took a swig. It burned. Where are her legs? I mumbled. And the freezer part of that fridge right over there. That's where all the leftovers go. Especially when my big chest freezer is full like it is now. He answered. Gross. I said. You eat people too? Well, not all at once, but hey, don't judge. You do too. Remember all those gorgeous burgers I made or them sweet honey ribs and that smoked Boston butt? Uncle Barry asked. That was people? I questioned in complete disgust. They were sobering up. <sighs> Danielle, give us a minute, Uncle Barry instructed. She left the shop and Uncle Barry walked over and knelt down to my height. Son, do you know who she was? He asked me, wiping the tears from my face. No, I replied. She was a heroin addict, but she was poor. So in order to get her drugs, she started a babysitting business. She learned that she could get all the drugs she ever wanted if she just rent out the young kids she babysat to certain kind of men. Men with bad intentions. You understand what I mean? He asked. You, you mean she, she hurt kids? I answered. In the worst way possible. You see all that hair over there? All that came from women that hurt children. So I pretend to date them, and then Danielle and I do what we want to them because, hey, they deserve it. And we only eat them because it's meat. Why would we waste it? Uncle Barry explained. I mean, it's kind of tasty, don't you think? He asked. Yeah, I don't know, I, I guess. I said, shrugging my shoulders and wiping away more tears. Why women? I asked. Well, because, silly. Women don't usually get caught. He answered. Here, take this. He said, handing me a gun he had tucked into the waistline of his jeans. Put it to her head and pull the trigger. Hold it tight though, cause it'll kick back. But you can handle it, you're strong. Look at you, you're stronger than you realize. And after you take care of this, we'll go find another one of them sorry son of a bitches and you can turn her into something that you design. Only this time Danielle and I don't need to pretend to break up. But listen, you can't tell anyone what we do because we are sick. We're just sick to the bad people. Now, go do what's right and save some children. 
he said, turning the safety off on the gun in my hands. I walked over to the woman, and I did what he asked. What she asked. And it felt good. It felt like the right thing. And by the time I was 15, Greg and I both had our own key to my uncle's shop, and we were in the family business. My mom never knew what went on in there, or why I couldn't keep a girlfriend, but she loved the barbecues. She always asked why everyone had a key but her. But she knew she wasn't allowed in my uncle's shop. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever found a park while wandering through a forest? I'm guessing the answer is no. I mean, folks find spooky things in the woods all the time. Like, I've heard of people discovering everything from bodies and strange animals to lost log cabins and even graveyards, but have you ever heard of a playground being built and abandoned smack dab in the middle of the woods? Well, neither had I until I stumbled across the lost park. It was the 14th of September, 1996. I distinctly remember because Tupac had died the day before. My mother was at work and I wasn't at school for some reason. It could have been a teacher workshop day or I could have been skipping class to be honest. I can't remember, but what I do remember is... The crazy events that unfolded that day deep in the woods next to my house. The woods were dark, thick, and unwelcoming to most people, but to me, it was a never-ending adventure so big that I wasn't sure where it ended. The trees lined the highway for miles and miles. They were dense enough to leave no indication of where they actually stopped. My goal when I was 12 was to explore every inch of them before I became a teenager. But no matter how deep I traveled into the forest, I never reached the other side of it. I would always bring my dog Samson with me. He was a big Samoan collie mix and I never got lost in the trees because he would simply sniff us back home. No breadcrumbs needed. Sam always knew where he was going, so I never had to worry about that part. Plus, over time, We had a main trail with a few worn-out grass paths that branched out where we walked. Each time we ventured out, I'd try to explore more uncharted ground. But as much as we discovered, the woods never seemed to end. Most of it just looked the same. I think only Sam knew the difference. But then, there was that day. The day I decided to take us well off the beaten path we'd worn down. And I mean way off. We were so far into unfamiliar territory that I could hear nothing but the dark woods breathing in the wind. The usual bustle of the highway in the distance was long gone at that point and even Sam appeared to be a little confused. I shuffled forward hoping to find something new and exciting and lo and behold, I did. I stopped abruptly when my eyes caught the sight before me. Sam stopped right by my side and let out a quick, low, woof. I think he was as surprised as I was. What we saw obviously hadn't triggered his sense of smell because he was having trouble processing it. He looked up at me and dropped his head low, with his tail still and hanging low between his legs. I knew he was uneasy straight away. He woofed under his breath again and turned back in the direction we came from. Strange, because Sam wasn't scared of anything. Not even snakes with a rattle or a pack of coyotes. He would always take point and defend me if he sensed a reason to be concerned, but this was the one time he ever backed down and retreated. He looked back at me waiting for me to follow him, but I was intrigued by the scene before me. I was standing in front of a massive, old, aging playground. I couldn't believe it. I quickly hurried forward, chuckling out loud with excitement. 
As I took a look around, I realized it had the coolest park equipment I'd ever seen. It was so unique. I mean, it had swings, but those swings were different. They were capable of catapulting a swinger higher than the typical playground swings that I was used to. The park also had two merry-go-rounds. One was a much larger version of the traditional style, but this one automatically started up and turned slowly when I stepped on it. The other merry-go-round was shaped more like a bell with a metal handle ring lining the top of the outside of the dome. And for speed, that thing was incredible. One slight push and the bell went round and round for ages before slowly beginning to slow down and gently give in to gravity's cold, dark grip. There were also three high, individually unique slides in the park. All of them were old and rusted, but the middle one was super tall compared to the other two. It was so tall that I was too scared to climb up its ladder. The slide on the left was completely enclosed in a straight dark tunnel with twists and turns that thrilled you just before lightly dropping you into a giant sand pit. The slide on the right was like a spiral staircase, but obviously more slide-like. I went down it once and it left me so dizzy that I had to sit down for a second. At the very top of the middle slide, there was a large ship-shaped deck with a couple of small fake telescopes. It was a great place to pretend to be a captain. The park was awesome. It had everything. I remember some kind of arm seesaw rotating rope swing combo thing too. I didn't quite understand its purpose. It was like a big horizontal swing with ropes hanging off the ends of it. I didn't know what it was supposed to do, but I made use of it anyway. The park in the woods had it all. There were weird jungle gems, strange monkey bars, super long seesaws that operated via a button on the handle, and plenty of other stuff that's quite hard to describe because I've still never seen anything I could compare the equipment to. I looked over at my dog. Sam was not happy. He was visibly nervous. I didn't care though, I loved it. No one else seemed to be aware that there was a playground out there. Nobody knew it existed. I had my own private, state-of-the-art, rusted park deep in the woods behind my house. What more could a kid want? Sam persisted to try and lead us away from the park. He kept woofing at me and heading off in the direction from which we came. I thought it was annoying and that he was attention-seeking, but eventually I gave in to his doggy demands and followed him back towards the path that led us home. I never told my mom what I found in the woods. And before I knew it, it was bedtime. But for the life of me, that night, I couldn't sleep. See, I grew up with ADHD, which was very much misunderstood at the time. People tend to dismiss the condition as spoiled brat syndrome, but I assure you, it's not that simple, especially when it came to bedtime. Most nights, I struggled to keep my eyes closed. I mean, I could lie awake for hours just staring at the dark ceiling in my bedroom, begging my mind to stop asking questions so I could fall asleep. It wasn't that I wasn't tired, I just couldn't shut down. Well, the night I discovered the park in the woods was no different. When I shut my eyelids, the playground was the only thing I could see. I laid there for hours tossing and turning thinking about how much fun I could be having contemplating what to call my new park, figuring out who, if anyone, was I gonna share my secret with. I was not going to go to sleep, so I decided to sneak out my bedroom window and visit the park while my mother slept peacefully in her bed. My mother worked at a place called The Colony as a cook during the day and she had another job at night, so I knew she wouldn't be aware that I was gone. I was also pretty sure I could find the park on my own, so I didn't take Sam. I'd sneaked out my window so many times at night that I really wasn't scared of much. I mean, up until then, nothing crazy had ever happened to shake me up. As I silently crept over and climbed out my ground floor bedroom window, Sam lay motionless on the foot of my bed sleeping and didn't move a muscle as I removed the screen and slid my bedroom window open before gently hoisting myself out into my backyard. I left the screen off and my window open. 
It would lock if I shut it and I'd be screwed. Sam could handle intruders if any should appear. I mean, he could get scary real fast when necessary. As I headed down the path, my anticipation of reaching the park made me fearless in the dark woods. ADHD can cause a tunnel vision type of focus when personal enjoyment and desire for adventure combine to tease your imagination. Looking back, it was a stupid and dangerous thing to do. As I walked through the brush, I could feel the black air on my skin. I could see the soft shimmer of lightning bugs and hear the annoying buzz of mosquitoes all around me. It took me about 45 minutes to finally reach the park. Once I arrived, I let out a shout of little boy joy. I was pumped. I'd found it again. And I knew what I had to do. The park wasn't really mine until I conquered it. So I quickly and happily hurried my way to the big tall middle slide. The one I was too scared to attempt to slide down earlier that day. Well, I was ready to man up and take the plunge. I was the king of that park, so I had to try everything in it. I made my way up the back of the slide and slowly began to climb up its rusty ladder, losing my sense of direction in the dark. It was so tall that I wasn't sure where the top of it was in the blackness of the night. I started to feel kind of creepy. My courage was depleting with every metal step I took up the slide. I tightened my grip on the steel rails attached to the left and right of the ladder. I thought I was almost there, but I could no longer see the ground below. I kept on climbing for what seemed like forever, and eventually, I reached the slide's top and took a look around. I was standing on a large metal base that would probably hold around four kids or so. I still couldn't see the ground below through the darkness, but I could vaguely make out the tops of the trees in the distance. Thousands of pine bark coated arms stretched out their knotted joints towards the night sky only a few feet below the height of the aged rusty slide I was standing on. How high up was I? When I thought that question to myself, I was totally freaked out. I knew at that moment there was no way in hell I was going down that slide. But I wasn't up for climbing back down through the darkness either. I was stuck. Are you hiding from them too? I heard a voice whisper right beside me on the base of the slide that made me lose my balance. As I stumbled backwards, I was sure I was heading towards the ladder exit seconds away from a helpless tumble to my ultimate doom. Then suddenly a hand grabbed my wrist and pulled me back to safety. I was shaking. I looked around through the darkness of the slide's base, but there was no one there. I was met with no reply. I spun around, carefully looking in every direction, even down the slide's barrel. No one. I called out again with my voice trembling. No answer. At that point, I was terrified. I'd just been saved by something I couldn't see and now I was stuck up there in the dark with it. And that's when the sound of a bell rang out through the darkness. It sounded like a school bell. I called out again. Shh, they'll hear you. Whispered the same voice from before. What? Who are you? You're scaring me. I whispered back, still unsure who or what I was talking to. You need to run. They're coming out to play. It's time for recess. They don't know you're up here yet, but they will. The mysterious voice replied. I was frozen in terror. Who's coming to play? I I'm scared. I uttered through tight, quivering lips. The reply I got turned my bones cold. The darkeners and the teacher are coming. Run! I was so confused, but as my eyes adjusted in the moonlight... I could make out the face of a boy about the same age as me, who was huddled in the corner of the slide's base. I was positive he wasn't there before. As I looked closer, to my horror, I realized he wasn't huddled at all. He was basically just a torso. A torso, a head, and one arm. His other arm and his two legs appeared to be severed, but they weren't cleanly cut. It was as if his limbs had been torn off. And his face, his eyes had been stitched shut. 
Half of the boy's mug appeared to be horribly mangled and deformed with an awful gore that turned one side of his face into minced flesh. Seeing that sight, my flight instinct kicked in and I dived down the slide face first. I hit the sand pit with a thud, jumped up to my feet, and took off running through the park. I could hear the thud of what sounded like tens of hooves behind me and guttural snorts that didn't sound human but didn't quite sound animal either. I looked back briefly, and that was the worst thing I could have done. Behind me, flooding the large, dark park, were these strange horned creatures that ran on all fours. They moved like nothing I've ever seen, like a dog and a monkey at the same time. I continued walking backwards, exiting the park, but my state of shock forced me to keep my eyes focused in the direction of the creatures. They continued to make weird snorts and muffled noises, but they never really let out any majorly audible sounds. They looked like they were covered in black skin and thin fur, head to toe. Their back legs had hooves while their front legs ended with hands, but not like human hands. The hands on the creatures had at least 20 fingers each. I'm positive, unless the moonlight was playing tricks on me. All the creatures were playing on the playground equipment like kids when suddenly, I heard the little boy begin to whimper and cry from the top of the tall slide. He was calling for his mommy. All the strange creatures stopped and began to make a kind of sniffing noise that appeared to be coming from their ears. One of them quickly stuck its head up in the air right in a beam of the surrounding moonlight. I couldn't move. They had no faces. Just a fresh paste of dark skin. Every sound and sniff seemed to come from their ears. I had had way more than enough. I spun around to book it, and I saw something I've wanted to forget ever since that moment. Hanging by their necks in the trees all around me were the torsos of hundreds of children. Their eyes were sewn shut just like the little boy on the tall slide. I fell in horror but quickly picked myself up. And that's when the bodies around me all started crying and screaming. I looked back and sure enough, this alerted the creepy creatures behind me. They all stopped and turned their faceless gazes in my direction. They weren't moving at all. They were just staring in my direction with neither eyes nor any motion whatsoever. I ran as fast as I could. When I got a brave length away, I glanced back in the distance one time. One look back was all I needed. Standing at the edge of the park with a finger up to shushed lips was a woman in a white button-up shirt wearing long black wiry hair. With her free hand, she appeared to be petting one of the creatures that faced me as it kneeled beneath her feet. It scuffed at the forest ground with its back hooves as if it was about to take off after me. I looked around. I didn't know where I was. I couldn't find the path. I was lost. And that's when I heard the sound of branches snapping near me. I started to panic. I, I was losing balance. I just knew I was doomed. Until I heard a low woof to my right. I looked. It was Sam. He must have followed me when I left the window open without my knowledge. I was never happier to see that mutt in my life. He yelped at me as if to say, hurry up, follow me. I tailed closely behind my heroic dog as we tore through the thorn bushes and thick dark brush before finally finding the path and running all the way home. When we got to my house, I thought I was going to die. I was so exhausted. We must have been running for 20 minutes. And not only that, but all the lights were on. My mother was awake, and she knew I'd been out. I was caught, but I didn't care. Sam and I were covered in thorns, ticks, scrapes, and bruises. I had no choice but to tell her everything. So I did. The whole story. But how the hell could she believe me? I swore to her, repeating the story over and over as she tweezed the deep thorns out of me and Sam for the following hour and a half. Disgusted. She said there was no park out there because she grew up in the area and had never heard or come across it, nor had any of her five siblings. Damn. What could I say? 
I barely believed me. The following day, against my will, she made me take her to the location of the park during the daylight. Now, I don't know if it moved or we were in the wrong place, but the playground was nowhere to be found. I was positive we were looking in the same place I was in the night before, but we found nothing but trees. It was gone, and I never saw it, the creatures, or the woman ever again. I lived to tell this tale even though I got grounded for life. I guess technically, I'm still grounded, but breathing nonetheless. I don't know if I'll ever get the answers to my questions. Shakes me up thinking about it to this day. Has anyone else ever stumbled across something like this in the woods? Anyone ever had an encounter with creatures of this type? Anybody got any idea what they were or where the park came from or where it went? I mean, how could it just simply vanish like that overnight? And what about the bodies of all those kids with the severed limbs? Ugh. All these years later, I still don't know what to think. Jonesboro, Arkansas is just a freaky place, and I guess that's all there is to it. But here's a piece of advice. If you ever stumble across an empty park in the woods, run. And don't ever look back. Respect your elders, my mother instructed when I asked her why Miss Miller's house smelled funny. I was five. Miss Miller was 85. Her husband had died decades ago, and she lived in the red brick apartment right next to ours in the Bill Clinton-funded projects on the north side of Jonesboro, Arkansas. We didn't live there for more than a few years. It, it was just a means to get out of the trailer we lived in on Walnut Street. My mother had written Governor Clinton's office in an act of desperation. As a single mom looking for work and a place for us to live, she got a letter back with an apartment offer in the projects and a job interview for a place on the south side called The Colony. She said yes to both and we moved in next door to Miss Miller a few weeks later. The apartment was nice enough and was directly across from a child's playground, but the area was rough so I was never allowed to play out there without my mother by my side. Some dodgy stuff went down out there that I was too young to recognize. I didn't ask too many questions. I was just happy to have so much space in my own room. There was a dead-end road that ran past our block and led into a biking trail that went through the forest not far from our apartment. I learned how to ride a bike on that road. I nearly killed a little girl in my backyard once too. My mother always set up one of those cheap Walmart swimming pools out back in the summer. It used to attract all the kids in the project. One particular day, myself and a little girl named Dakota were taking turns seeing who could stay under the water the longest when we became thirsty. We were soaking wet, so we couldn't go inside. I jumped out and grabbed the water hose. I told Dakota that we could drink the water that came from it. That's what most kids in Arkansas did. She agreed and I turned on the faucet to a light flow. Dakota put the hose up to her lips and began gulping down water. I remember thinking it would be funny to turn the faucet on full blast. As a joke, I did. She immediately began to choke and gag profusely, red-faced and eyes bulging out of her head. The water hose dropped from her hands. She grabbed her throat and fell backwards into the shallow pool. Her legs were hanging outside of the edge of the pool, kicking like crazy. The rest of her body was under the water. I was frozen. My mother and Dakota's father were nowhere to be seen. I panicked. I couldn't even scream. Tears started welling up in my eyes as I began to shake with intense horror. I didn't mean to hurt her, I just thought it would be funny, but she was going to die and I was too scared to react. I felt a warm trickle run down my leg. I was peeing myself. Suddenly I spotted an adult. It was my elderly neighbor, Miss Miller. She was sitting out on her back patio with a cup of coffee and a newspaper. She wasn't reading the paper though. It was folded flat on the table and she was staring right at me. Help, please. I uttered in a faint whisper. She didn't even budge. She just smiled and sipped her coffee, never blinking, even once. Out of nowhere, I heard footsteps bounding in my direction and a familiar voice. D Dakota! No, no, no! Baby, please! Hang on! I'm here! I'm here! Da Daddy's here! It was her father. 
With one quick motion, he scooped Dakota out of the water and up in his arms. I'll never forget the shade of purple she had turned or the amount of water she puked up. I almost killed her. Everything happened so fast. All of a sudden, my mother was there as well as neighbors from other apartments, and Dakota's father was screaming at me while she clung to his neck, crying at the top of her lungs. Hey, why didn't you scream for help? She could have died! Answer me! All I could say was, It was supposed to be a joke. I didn't mean to. <laughs> Dakota was fine in the end, but she was never allowed near me again. I was treated as if I legitimately tried to take her life. After everyone left, my mother ripped me a new one while I stood dripping wet in the July heat. She gave me a towel and instructed me to go inside immediately. That was the end of my swimming that summer. I dried myself off and was just about to go inside when I heard a quiet chuckle. <laughs> I looked up. It was Miss Miller. She was staring right at me, smiling, a big toothless grin. Her dentures were sitting on the table facing me. She giggled again, this time a little louder. <laughs> You're supposed to help. I muttered, confused and broken by the previous events. She laughed a little harder this time, but slower and lower in pitch. <laughs> she tilted her head down and towards me, but never took her eyes off of mine. Creeped out, I quickly finished drying myself off and hurried inside. I knew then that something was off about Miss Miller. I never told anyone about Miss Miller's oddities that day. They wouldn't have listened. Everyone was pissed at me for a long time after that, or at least it felt that way. Dakota was never allowed to play with me again, and I don't think I've looked at a water hose the same way. My mother and I would visit Miss Miller's smelly apartment a couple times a week to check on her. My mother would have a cup of coffee while Miss Miller and I would have a spoonful of her special blend, red honey. A spoonful of honey was some kind of daily ritual for Miss Miller, something old people did in the 90s, I guess. I never asked questions. It was delicious, though. It was strange to see an elderly white lady living in the projects. I mean, there were drug deals going on all around us, parties and rap music constantly blaring through the walls. My mother hated it, but I kind of loved the rap music part. Miss Miller seemed unaware, or just didn't care. On the day of my ninth birthday, I was finally allowed to ride my bike on the trail at the end of the road that went through the woods without an adult being by my side. I remember being thrilled to finally feel like a big kid for once. There were several walking and biking trails within the trees, some longer than others, but they all led to the same place eventually, the cave. I wasn't allowed in the cave. I wasn't even supposed to be near it. I was well warned to steer clear of that place. To be honest, at nine years old, I wasn't interested in venturing into a dark hole in the ground alone anyways. But something about my newfound freedom of exploration made me curious. I rode the trail, humming the Ghostbusters theme, until I reached the mouth of the cave, where I stopped, popped my kickstand, and decided to take a closer look inside. Again, I had no intentions of going in. I was just curious and feeling a little braver than normal. As I listened at the opening, I remember thinking about how the echoes of wind reminded me what you hear when you put a seashell up to your ear. I wondered if I was hearing a distant ocean, but suddenly the sound changed. It didn't sound as soothing. It sounded like buzzing. It sounded like bees buzzing. Hello? I shouted down into the blackness. My voice bounced around for ages before fading off somewhere far away in the black of the cave. The buzzing had stopped by the time my echo had trailed off. Hello? I roared, louder this time. Well, hello, child. An eerie voice answered back from somewhere in the darkness. I jumped back a couple feet. My heart started pounding. Wh who's there? I asked in a trembling voice. I didn't feel so brave anymore. Why, I'm your friend, the voice said. It sounded and felt ever so slightly familiar. My mom told me not to talk to strangers, I replied, inching towards my bike. Stop, the voice shrieked. I froze. We're not strangers, my dear. Not all of us, anyway. You remember Dakota, don't you? The voice asked. Yeah, my neighbor. 
I said, still tensed up. Well, she's in here, and there are others in here as well, so why don't you just come in and say hello? Why, we're playing a fun game. And if you come in now, I'll give you a spoonful of honey. <laughs> the voice sneered. Miss Miller, is that you? Is Dakota in there with you? Dakota! I called out. Dear boy, she can't hear you. The voice replied in a low hush. W why not? I questioned. Because, child, she has no ears to hear you with. I tore them off to make a new necklace. <laughs> the voice snarled and crackling with laughter. Miss Miller, you're scaring me. I croaked. The laughter stopped. <laughs> Who's Miss Miller? The voice asked in a hushed tone. I didn't know what to say. The mouth of the cave was silent for a moment, and then suddenly, I heard something coming towards me. I quickly bent down and picked up my bike, preparing to bolt. An object rolled out of the cave and hit the rear tire of my bike, causing me to leap off the ground. At first, I thought it was a ball or armadillo or something, but when I looked closer, I realized I was looking at a freshly severed human head. It was missing its ears. It looked like... Dakota. Ready or not? The voice grumbled. I screamed as loud as I could and took off on my bike, pedaling as fast as possible through the woods and back home to our apartment. I parked my bike in the backyard and ran inside. I never told my mother about the cave or my encounter with what sounded like Miss Miller. When she questioned my tear-streaked face, I just told her I fell over a curb. She assured me I was okay and offered me another piece of my birthday cake. After the incident at the cave, I didn't go back outside that day, and for the rest of the day, I stuck close to my mother's side until around 8pm, which is when she sent me to bed. I laid in bed awake, trying to physically shake off the creepy chills crawling along my skin as I stared at the moon outside my window. I could hear my mother laughing every so often as she watched TV, and while it did comfort me to hear her muffled voice through the walls, I couldn't stop thinking about the cave. Miss Miller, and the severed head of Dakota. I lay there for what felt like hours, running back the day's events over and over in my mind. My thoughts were like a videotape on loop. Was it Miss Miller? Was it Dakota? Was it even real? Can a child's imagination really conjure up things of that nature? I didn't know, but eventually, I fell asleep. All night. I dreamt that Miss Miller was outside my window. She was naked and smiling that creepy denture-free grin. Miss Miller wore a necklace made out of human ears. One of her leathery hands was inside the dirt plastered head of Dakota. She was making Dakota's jaws move up and down like a puppet while mocking her voice. Please don't kill me. I'll be good. I'll be good. <laughs> She repeated over and over in a fake little girl voice before snickering. Dakota's earless head jiggled from left to right as a black, thick liquid poured out of her mouth and nose. Dakota's greasy hair fell across her badly damaged face while Miss Miller continued to animate her jaws. I couldn't place it at the time, but my body felt like it was experiencing what I know now as sleep paralysis. All I could do was watch. I'm not sure how long exactly, but after what felt like hours of a torturous, horrific nightmare, Miss Miller dropped Dakota's head on the ground and started moaning softly and maniacally as she rubbed herself with the same hand that was inside Dakota's head. She placed her free hand on my window and stared blankly into my eyes as she rapidly touched herself. I shut my eyes as tight as possible, but I could still hear her muffled breathing I began to whisper, It's not real. It's not real. It's not real. <laughs> over and over while clasping my hands over my ears. <laughs> the next thing I knew, it was morning. Sunlight filled my room. I could hear rap music thumping next door through my walls. Miss Miller was gone. It was just a horrible dream, I thought. But I couldn't get the images of that nightmare out of my head. My mother entered the room with a cheerful smile. Good morning, sleepyhead. I made you breakfast. She chirped. My mind was still elsewhere. Listen, honey, I love you so much. 
I would never want anything to happen to you. You know that, don't you, kiddo? She asked, with her entire expression morphing into a more concerned demeanor. Of course, Mom. I told her. I was about to ask her what she meant, but she spoke up first. Oh, hey, you missed a birthday present yesterday. She declared, smile reforming on her lips. She disappeared out of my room and returned a few moments later, carrying a small jam jar full of a thick red-colored liquid. Here you go. Since you always seem to like it so much, Mrs. Miller brought you a jar of her famous homemade honey. Apparently her family keeps bees out at the ranch on Richardson. She makes this blend herself with a top secret recipe. She said to tell you happy birthday. She said as she handed me the jar. It was still sticky. I started thinking maybe I was wrong about Miss Miller. She was an old lady, right? Dakota wasn't in the news. I didn't see Miss Miller at the cave. And the night before was clearly just a nightmare because of what I thought I saw at the cave. I mean, it was possible that I was just seeing things. Parents always say stuff like, Oh, it's just your imagination. Whenever a kid says there's a monster under their bed or in their closet, so maybe that's all this was. My imagination. I started to feel better as I unscrewed the lid on the container of red honey and dipped my finger into it to score a drop. As I dabbed it on my tongue, I remembered how sweet it tasted. It was delicious. Even if its odor smelled slightly like copper pennies. The evil Miss Miller must have just been in my head. No more scary movies for me, I thought. Later that day, I decided to go outside and play with my G.I. Joes. My mother told me to wait and she'd come out with me and read her magazine. I said okay as I gathered the action figures I wanted to take with me. I played for about an hour, paying no attention to anyone else. I heard a back door open and close from the other apartments across from my backyard. I popped my head up to see Dakota's father. He looked angry. Furious, actually. Our eyes met for a few seconds. What are you looking at, you little shit? He roared, rattling my nerves. Hey, Todd! My mother shouted back at him. Honey, go inside. I'll be in in just a minute, okay? She said softly to me. But mom, why is Todd- She cut me off. Honey, now. She gently affirmed. I glanced over at Dakota's dad again. He was seething. I did as I was told and hurried inside. I sneakily watched as my mother headed over to stand face to face with Todd. I couldn't hear what they were saying, but it didn't look like a pleasant conversation. Eventually, Todd angrily turned around, stomped off, and slammed his back door. I couldn't figure out what I did. It had been two years since the hose incident with Dakota. He hadn't seemed upset with me in the last two years, and he always waved. I was puzzled. I began to think maybe the adults around me were seeing things too. When my mother returned, she was shaking and looked like she was going to cry for a minute. With a deep breath, she gathered herself together and explained, Oh, sweetie, it was nothing to do with you. Todd just thought he saw you playing with one of Dakota's toys that she's been looking for. It's been... Uh, missing. Uh, and they still haven't found it. It was just a misunderstanding. Everything's going to be fine, okay? Everything felt odd. I'd never seen Dakota playing with G.I. Joes, or any action figures for that matter. She was a clear-cut, doll type of girl. Is everything okay now, Mommy? I asked. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course it is. She smiled. Todd just shook me up a little, that's all. Listen, sweetie, I'm working a double shift tonight at Pizza Inn, and your grandmother's up in Iowa visiting your Aunt Judy for the weekend, so I don't have a babysitter for you. Just my luck, I thought. I'm gonna have to go to work with her and sleep in the back. I hated doing that. It was the most boring thing a kid could do. Oh, I hate staying at Pizza Inn all night. It's boring. I pleaded. Well, honey, you're in luck then. She continued. Because Miss Miller offered to watch you tonight. My heart was in my throat. But do not give her a hard time. She's 85. And don't eat all her honey. You've got your own jar now. And remember, respect your elders. Now, I'm going to go get ready. And you should too. She said before kissing my forehead and hurrying off to prepare herself for a double shift. My feelings were heavily conflicted. Imagination. Just my imagination. Miss Miller's a good person. I thought over and over to myself as I gathered my things in a backpack to take to Miss Miller's. When I finished, I sat on my bed in the ambience of my mother's hairdryer blowing down the hall and her 
Getting ready for work, record blaring in the distance from the old turntable. I hummed the Ghostbusters theme song to pump myself up, but inside, the walls of my head were plastered with dark, red, dread. Imagination or not, I couldn't help but feel more than a little helpless. It was already dark when my mother walked me over to her elderly neighbor's apartment. I asked my mom if I could just go with her instead, but she refused. She told me that it was two for one night at Pizza Inn and that they'd be too swamped to look after me. I'd just be in the way. Seconds later, we were standing under the porch light, face to face with Miss Miller's front door. The door opened before my mother could knock, showing a seemingly happy old lady who was joyfully singing a belated happy birthday to me. Miss Miller explained that she was looking forward to a long night of good company. She seemed so sweet and grandmotherly, but I just couldn't look in her eyes without sensing danger. Not after everything I'd felt. She welcomed me in and my mother kissed me goodnight, assuring me that she'd be back before sunrise. Then the door closed and for the first time I was alone with Miss Miller. She politely instructed me to come into her living room and have a seat, but to be quiet because her favorite soap was on. I quietly did as I was told and sat down on the clear plastic covered love seat by the window. Miss Miller sat across from me in a matching chair, eagerly watching her show, giggling intently, eyes wide with over-exaggerated excitement. It was odd. I mean, the TV. The sound wasn't even on. I stared out the window at the park across the street for a while in silence. The TV show seemed to go on and on, so after a while, I took a couple G.I. Joes and some Hot Wheels out of my pockets and began playing with them while Miss Miller watched the muted television. What seemed like hours went by. Nothing changed. I needed to use the toilet, so I decided to ask, sliding my hand up like I was in school. Miss Miller... Can I use the bathroom? Lightning quick, she rose to her feet faster than I thought humanly capable. She was facing me, glaring into my eyes, red-faced and shaking with intense rage. You made me miss it! (laughs) She roared at the top of her lungs, tears streaming down her leathery cheeks. I dropped my trembling hand. I was petrified stiff. I almost wet myself again, but didn't only because I was afraid she might cut it off if I did. As if a storm of rage had passed, Miss Miller suddenly stopped freaking out and slowly sank back into her chair like nothing more than a feeble old lady. A smile crept onto her face. Her head was facing the TV when she whispered, I'm only teasing, child. Of course you can use the bathroom. No need to ask. It's just in there next to the pantry door. (laughs) She stuck her bottom row of dentures out, wiggled them around against her upper lip, and made a freaky num-num sound before quickly retracting them back into her mouth and flashing a creepy, misleading smile. Without looking, she pointed towards the kitchen and then continued to giggle at the inaudible commercials on the TV screen as if nothing had happened. Some kind of liquid blob fell off of her hand and splattered on the floor below. She didn't appear to notice. It looked like strawberry jam or something, but I swear there was a dead fly or bee in it. I stood up slowly and nervously walked to the kitchen in search of the bathroom. My heart was still pounding with the shock of Miss Miller's outburst and the strange gooey blob on the floor. What was that stuff? I timidly looked around her tiny kitchen. I could still hear the faint sound of her snickering coming from the living room. I walked over to the first door I saw. The handle left my hand sticky when I opened the door. I was looking at the inside of a pantry and its marble contact paper-coated shelves were full of jars of her red honey, nothing else. How much of the red stuff did one person need? I looked a little closer. There were messy red blots and glazed splats stuck to the side walls of the pantry. It was everywhere. The four wooden shelves were dripping with what I assumed was globs of spilt honey. I guess Miss Miller never cleaned up after fetching herself a spoonful. It appears Miss Miller doesn't adapt the open one jar at a time rule either, but the bees on the back of the door sent a chill down my spine. I quickly and quietly closed the door. There was another door down the short hall. 
I headed towards it, but I was caught off guard the second I grabbed the handle. You stop! I spun around. Miss Miller was standing inches from my face, glaring at me with hate in her eyes. I'm sorry, Miss Miller. I was just looking for the... She cut me off. Shh, be quiet. She whispered, placing a dirty, slimy finger on my mouth. That's when I noticed. Her panties were down to her ankles. They were stained different colors in the center. I couldn't breathe. We were both quiet for a couple moments. Frozen moments. It felt like the earth had stopped spinning and ground was giving away beneath me at the same time. Then, a second later, she started peeing in the middle of the floor, right on top of her dirty, pulled-down old lady underwear. I still remember the feeling of warm drops splashing onto my feet. She let out a long, deep, low sigh of relief midstream. Her eyes half rolled back into her head as her hand fell from my lips, back to her side, limp. The bathroom's over there, child. (laughs) She whispered in ecstasy, twitching with delight just before she finished. She pointed towards a white door on the other side of the kitchen. As I fearfully walked around her and headed towards the door, I really thought she was going to grab me. But she didn't move. At all. Nor did she make a sound. I opened up the door, and just before I closed it, Miss Miller crept past and headed back into the living room, dragging her soiled panties with her. I nearly leapt out of my skin, but felt relieved a few seconds later when I heard her sit down on the squeaky couch. I quickly shut the door and put the fragile lock to use. I was in a tiny bathroom. When I found the light and switched it on, several huge cockroaches scattered. They were so big, you could hear the pitter-patter of their legs on the linoleum floor as they fled. They ran behind the dirty brown stained toilet. Gross. Still... I felt safer with them. It wasn't big enough for a bathtub. It had a tiny electric walk-in shower booth, tiled interior. It was riddled with disgusting splatters of red slop or some other kind of gross substance. Dead bees completely covered up the drain hole at the bottom. That and clumps of hair were blocking a nasty pool of water from draining from the shower basin. The liquid looked like V8 vegetable juice. It was mostly red, with small, fleshy pieces floating in it. I had no idea what I was looking at. The bathroom stank like holy hell from whatever was in that shower. Even so, I remained in there for at least an hour. She didn't check on me once. Suddenly, I heard what sounded like the front door open and close. I waited a moment and then cracked the door open slightly to peek out. Nothing. I listened for another moment in petrified silence. Nothing. When I finally got the courage to come out, Miss Miller was gone. In her place was a spoonful of honey sitting leaking onto the kitchen table next to a piece of notebook paper that read, Thought you might like a spoonful. I have to go check on the bees. I'll be back for you soon. Love, Miss Miller. The sticky note she left was written in red. I noticed smudged fingerprints on the paper. Miss Miller must have finger-painted the note. The letters were still dripping wet. I wasn't in the mood for honey. So there I was, all by myself in a house in the projects. I remembered wanting the night to hurry up and be over so bad. Miss Miller had just left me there, all alone, while she was supposed to be babysitting me. Looking back, it was probably safer than being in her company. But I was just a child. I didn't know what or how to think. I knew something was badly wrong from the whole situation, and I was scared. It was time to call my mom. I found the yellow pages under the coffee table in the living room, fumbled through to pee, and found the number for Pizza Inn. I felt more at ease having my mom's work number, but one problem still remained. No matter where I looked, I couldn't find a phone in Miss Miller's apartment. I checked the living room and kitchen. Nothing. I figured I could run to Dakota's house and ask Todd to call my mom, but both doors were locked with key-only deadbolts. Even the windows in Miss Miller's apartments had those black protective bars on them. I was stuck, and that's when my mind began to run away with itself. I started thinking about the voice at the cave. What if it really was Miss Miller I heard? 
My mom said the bees our family kept were near the cave, but no, it couldn't be. That would involve a headless Dakota, search parties, neighborhood lockdown, panic, you name it. There would be no hiding the chaos in the projects if a little girl was missing or dead. I went and sat in the living room for what seemed like hours. No sign of Miss Miller. I was getting hungry and it felt late. There wasn't a single clock that I could see, so I wasn't sure what the exact time was. I just needed to find a spare key and get out of there. At the very least, Miss Miller was a horrible babysitter. And there was still one room I hadn't checked. The one through the kitchen at the end of the hall. It had to be your bedroom. I knew my only chance of finding a spare key or phone would be behind that door. When I walked into the room, a sharp wave of rotten stink hit me in the back of the nose. I nearly hurled. I plugged my nose, but the smell was so intrusive that you could taste it. Full flavor. You know that smell you get after steaming Brussels sprouts or cabbage? Well, it was like that and a dead wet dog combined. In her room was an old dirty bed, a lamp, a set of drawers, and a large cedar chest. No phone. I checked the drawers for a key. Nothing. Mostly just underwear and old people knickknacks. In the last drawer, I found a brown folder. It was about Miss Miller and her husband. Let me tell you, if you think Miss Miller is bad, then Mr. Miller was a train wreck. He spent 20 years in the Tillsboro colony for serial rape, abuse, and torture of 34 young children, including his own sister. Miss Miller had married this guy. I thought maybe that's why she was so cuckoo. Imagine if that monster had been your husband. The folder also contained pictures of mutilated children. I was too young to see things of that nature. and stuck with me ever since. How did Miss Miller even get a hold of those? I put the folder away. It was too much. The last place there could be a key would be in the chest. I walked over to it, heart pounding out of my ribs, and opened the lid. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. It was the leathery, dried old body of what looked like another elderly woman. Her face was fixed in a frozen, terrified expression. She must have been in there for a very long time. Years. I freaked out and jumped back. The lid slammed shut. I got out of the room as quickly as possible. Tears were streaming down my face as I ran down the hall and into the kitchen. I was headed towards the front door to try and kick it open. Two steps into the kitchen, I slipped on my bare feet and fell hard on the cold tiles. I stood up quickly, my left ankle in agony. I had skidded on a trail of red slimy stuff that appeared to be similar to what fell off Miss Miller in the living room. The red trail led all the way to the pantry door and stopped in front of it. The door was slightly cracked. You could hear something coming from the other side. It sounded like crying. Hello? Miss Miller? I called out. No answer. Just faint, soft, frantic mumbling. I called out again as I reached out and opened the pantry door a few more inches. I quickly jerked my hand back in shock when I realized that Miss Miller was standing there with her back to me. She was covered in honey. Hundreds of bees were stuck in the red goo on her body. She wasn't wearing anything other than her stained underwear, so I could see the little welts swelling up all over her body where she had been stung. The mumbling I heard was Miss Miller counting backwards. She stopped when she hit number one. I froze. Miss Miller, are you gonna hurt me? I whispered in fear. Ready or not? She answered in a low grumble. At that moment, I knew it was definitely, beyond a doubt, the same voice I heard at the cave. Miss Miller sprung from the pantry in a state of rage unlike anything I'd ever experienced. I ran as fast as I could towards the front door, but she was too quick. She grabbed a hold of my shirt and slammed me to the ground hard, banging my head on the tiles. While I was dazed, 
Miss Miller dragged me down the hall towards her bedroom. She was unreasonably strong for her age. I tried to hold onto the door frame as she pulled me into the bedroom, but it was no use and I was no match for her. I screamed and cried and kicked, but it didn't faze her. She was crazed and enraged. She picked me up and slammed me down on my face next to her bed. I felt my jaw snap. It was broken. Miss Miller climbed on top of me and brought her face close to mine. Her breath was horrible. Red goo dripped from her mouth into mine. I turned my head away, and that's when I saw it. Another body, this one much fresher, folded up under her bed, covered in dead bees and honey. Miss Miller bit down on my ear. In the terror of what happened in that bedroom, I could only think about one thing. My mother. I had prayed to God that she would save me. Miss Miller was about to rip my ears off with her dentures when the front door exploded open and footsteps came running towards us. I heard someone shout, Jonesboro PD! Let go of the kid and get your ass down on the ground! It was the cops. Music to my ears. As they attempted to restrain Miss Miller, she fought them aggressively to get back at me. She never took her eyes off mine. They eventually got her pinned down and cuffed before dragging her out to an awaiting police car. They took me straight to the hospital for treatment of my jaw, torn ear, and a fractured cheekbone. My mom never forgave herself for what happened that night, but it wasn't her fault. How was she supposed to know what Miss Miller really was? No one knew the darkness she carried, a darkness I witnessed in glimpses. That night was the last time I saw Miss Miller, but it's not the end of the story. We moved to Batesville the day I got out of the hospital. That's when I found out why Todd was at our door angry. It was because of Dakota. She was missing. She saw me venture into the woods with my new bike and apparently wanted to wish me happy birthday. Her dad went against his gut feeling and allowed her to follow me. He figured the past was in the past. He thought Dakota was old enough. He thought she'd be safe. And she was never seen alive again. He thought I had something to do with her disappearance until the day they arrested Miss Miller. The body under her bed belonged to none other than Dakota. Everything I witnessed, the cave, the window, the head, it was all real. Miss Miller didn't have a family that made honey. She made the honey all by herself in the cave. The red color of the honey was due to the fact that she stored the body parts of her victims in it. The police found large containers of the honey deep in the cave, full of human remains, namely heads, including Dakota's. But here's where the story gets even stranger. The old body of the woman in the chest was not a mere victim. She was, in fact, Nancy Miller. And Nancy Miller was never married. Instead, she spent her whole life devoted to caring for her deranged twin brother, Nathan Miller. Nathan had been sent to the Tillsboro Colony, an asylum of sorts, after horrendous crimes against children and a string of other violent offenses. But he escaped years ago and had been on the run for decades. Miss Miller was in that chest. I had never met her. None of us had. The evil we knew was Nathan. He had assumed her identity for years after murdering her and keeping her body in a chest next to where he slept. Rumor has it that Nathan was a sadist and addicted to pain. He'd cover himself and his victims in honey after luring a kid out to the cave. He'd then aggravate the bees, causing them to attack. There in the darkness, Nathan would torture and rape children while thousands of bees stung and became stuck to both of them. This went on for decades, while Nathan Miller posed as his dead twin sister, Nancy Miller. There was no old lady Miss Miller. She never made it to old age. Every time I think about Nathan Miller, I feel nine again. I feel the guilt. I feel the shame. I feel... exposed. 
but the fear is what keeps me up at night. Nathan was declared insane and sent back to Tillsboro. He's probably dead by now. I mean, he'd be like a hundred at this stage. But still, sometimes I want to call to Tillsboro just to make sure he's still in there. He escaped once and caused a terrible, terrible mess. The Clawsboro Christmas Diseasy, a creepy pasta story written by Mr. Black Pasta. It was Christmas month and through the cold air, no words could be heard, not even a prayer. For God took the month off and he couldn't be found in all of a heartless and cruel little town. Clawsboro falls silent every dreadful December As winter sweeps in a cold that no one will remember No wood will catch light nor coal will take heat Kids will fight one another just for something to eat No playing outside, no toys under trees Black rings under eyes and a poison disease Turkeys go missing, fat wolves there are plenty. Folks disappear every year from a town where once there were many. Children be starving with little to wear, and adults never smile nor dare even to care. If the children are hungry and in need of a munch, stray cats or the rats make an excellent lunch. Eleven straight months, the town avoids all its fear. But the disease does as it pleases the last month of the year. Long be forgotten the time of Christmas cheer, for blood is the stain left behind by evaporated tears. <laughs> Dads chain up the mommies to walls under floors and cleave fresh meat from their tummies when the hunger is sore. But also the mothers are crazed by the Christmas disease. For they torture their children whenever they please. The sons of the town are never accused, left standing for hours in snow with no shoes. The boys beg and demand with their feet turning blue, let us come in, we're dying. But the cold mothers refuse. Daughters are strung up to poles by dads that are rabid. They claw at their bones, throw stones and... You don't want to know what else happens. Brothers lie with their sisters and are never rejected, for by the Christmas disease they too are infected. <laughs> See, the Christmas disease comes round every year with an addiction to pain and attraction to fear. Though abuse, it is rampant. They shed not a tear, for the Clawsboro sin is forgotten by the first of the year. The bliss will be back, the sun shines till September. Bonfires light up the night, ever burning with ember. Parents hold hands and siblings will play, never knowing infection is headed their way. <laughs> From the 1st of December, symptoms do show, increasing in intensity with the fall of the black snow. Peeling skin and rage start slow With a stuffy nose and bleeding from every hole Pus seeps from the eyes of the Clawsboro people Their teeth turn yellow and sharpen with hunger and evil Purple veins swell up and show in their skin Along with the genitalia of the adult townsmen <laughs> I bet you think the women do not get it easy But even the men Safe from the Christmas disease. -y. With passion and heat and uncontrollable rage, people turn on each other and no one is safe. 
But true horror becomes on the day 24, for the monster sneaks into houses on the night of our Lord. He slides down the chimney ever so creeping. Terrified for their lives, no one is sleeping. A white suit stained red for it's covered in dried life. The king of infection is coming in the dead of the night. With nine winged horned beasts he arrives by flight. And he feeds fresh human meat to the beast whose nose is alight. Presents are no more, he just takes what he wishes. Innocence from children stolen with kisses. When he's hungry and searching for something to eat, he just looks to the fathers who are swollen with meat. With a swift swing of his knife, he detaches erection. He does it not just for food, but as well for affection. As dads lay bleeding, he turns his direction to moms who are sleeping with the Christmas infection. So be aware, ye young ones, who do not leave him treats, for under your bed waits the Clawsboro creep. If you think he's not real and you drift off to sleep, your parents will wake into a mess on your sheets. Because screams go unheard through the Christmas diseasey, others don't stir and good children keep sleeping. Be happy you have Santa and not a replacement. Cause in Clawsboro, Santa's an anagram for none other than Satan. <laughs> Merry Christmas. My car was out of action at the time. So I decided to walk home after my shift at the straightway 24-hour diner. Being a male waitress means people are less sympathetic towards you, unless you happen to be cute. But I'm not. Instead, I eat a lot. I guess I like food better than I like people. When I clocked out, I asked around to see if anyone would give me a ride home. I thought maybe someone could take a break and help me out. I mean... It was freezing outside. But I guess if you don't look hungry, you don't look cold. So I said, fuck it. It was only four miles. I figured it'd be good exercise. I could walk off half of that Snickers bar I was planning to munch in my bed when I got home. Obviously, I didn't want to hike home at 2 a.m. in the cold and on foot initially, but I talked myself into it. And it seemed like a healthy idea until I walked out the front door of the diner. The razor-sharp, sub-zero wind felt as if it was cutting fine slits into my face. My hands were leathery ice as I struggled to breathe the frostbitten air comfortably. I sped up the pace for a while to keep myself warm, but it didn't help. It was just too damn cold. The straight, dark road surrounded on both sides by forest just seemed to grow longer and longer as it stretched deep into the never-ending black darkness ahead of my feet. I paused to look back at the diner. It was so far away that I couldn't even read the letters on the huge neon sign in the parking lot. Nor could I make out anyone or anything inside through the windows. I'd never seen it like that, from so far away, for so long three miles of one straight flat road. You can see the whole way during the day, fog permitting. The straightway diner sits on the right side of the road just before a sharp curve at the end of the straight. It's a dangerous ass place to drive out of. It'd be easy to get clipped by another driver that turns the curve in anticipation of speeding down the straight. But I had nothing to worry about. I was on opposite ends of the road at that stage. So, I was safe. I rubbed my eyes with my fingers. I couldn't feel anything. My sense of touch was numb due to the cold. And I was so tired that I started walking with my eyes closed. I don't know. I kind of felt like it was helping. Kind of like when you catch someone falling asleep in public and they tell you they're just resting their eyes. I was using the same excuse as I pushed forward further and further away from the diner. With one foot on the road and one on the grass, I blindly shivered my way in the direction of where I thought home was. 
The wind was howling like a mad dog and the chill had set in my bones at that stage. My teeth chattered together uncontrollably as I forced myself to move faster. After God knows how long, I stopped, turned back, and opened my eyes to gauge how far I'd walked, but the straightway diner was no longer visible. I mean, I'd never had to walk home before, but it's supposed to be visible for the full three mile stretch, unless the power was out or the diner had closed for some reason. Either way, I'd have been shocked if the doors were locked. The straightway is and always has been 24 seven. Apart from being on the straightest and flattest road in the state, it's also known for having never closed a single day in its 60 years of business. So I should definitely have seen it in the distance, even as a small, star-sized dot of light. But the road behind me was pale dark. I started to think I'd taken a wrong turn or something while I was eye resting. When I finally turned back around, I was shocked by two things. For a start, I was no longer standing on asphalt. Below my feet was nothing but a dirty old gravel road that I must have been traveling on for some time because I could see no pavement within a close proximity of me. I had definitely been walking on a smooth flat surface up until that point. And no, I wasn't asleep. I was resting my eyes, remember? The second thing that caught me off guard was the sight of an old wooden bus stop bench. There was a 70 something year old woman sitting on one side of it. She was wearing a faded thin beige corduroy jacket with no gloves, no scarf, no hat and nothing else to warm herself up properly. But she didn't seem cold in the slightest. She was sitting happily, legs crossed, while humming a tune I didn't recognize, but for some strange reason, it warmed me up on the inside, as if it made me feel the presence of actual heat. I took a step closer to her, still trying to make sense of my surroundings. The old woman kept her head down and continued to hum carelessly. When I got close to her, I asked her if she knew when the next bus ran. She stopped humming and said nothing for several moments. I started to think that maybe she had a screw or two loose when she finally answered in a pleasant elderly voice. The late bus will be here soon. I was still disoriented and unaware of how I got where I was or even where I was exactly, but the hope of a warm bus to get me home or at very least near home, relieved me. I asked the old woman where the bus was headed. It will take you where you're going. <laughs> she said with a soft chuckle. Right, uh, well, uh, do you know how much, how much a ticket is? I questioned. Why, the journey is free. Oh, oh great, because uh, cause I'm kind of broke at the minute, I said. Oh, don't worry, child. Have a seat next to me and warm yourself up. Sure, okay. The driver will stamp your hand when you're bored. She said politely. I sat down on the bench next to the grandmotherly old woman who continuously hummed while we waited for the late bus to arrive. I began thinking to myself as I sat there. What was a 70 to 80 year old woman doing sitting in a freezing bus stop at 3 a.m.? On top of that, I'd never heard of a late bus service around here. I knew of no public transport that ran into the AMs on this side of the state. It was puzzling, but needs must, and I needed warmth. Out of nowhere, the old woman sharply stood up and said through a smile in a low, crumbling voice, It's coming. I looked all around in anticipation, but I couldn't see or hear anything that resembled a bus. I turned my head back in the direction I came from and was about to ask the woman if she was sure we hadn't missed the bus when another male voice caught me off guard. Will you be joining us for this journey or are you waiting on another ride? I spun back around towards the voice and realized it was coming from the inside of an old vintage public bus. The voice was the driver's. He sat in the driver's seat, staring straight ahead as he motioned for me to step forward into the dim lit interior of the bus. I stood up and moved forward, still so confused. I started to get cold again, 
I shivered as I told the driver. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess I, guess I am. Uh, listen, uh, I, I was walking home from work and uh, ooh, I, I kind of got lost and I'm just, I'm just, uh, it's really cold. Can, can you? He cut me off. I'll get you where you need to go, but you gotta hurry up. I'm on a tight schedule and you kind of wasted my time. At that moment, I realized that the old woman was gone. Uh, hey, uh, there was an old woman that was... He interrupted me again. The old woman's already on the bus. Stamped in all. Now let's go! I'm already late, and I still gotta stamp your hand. I couldn't figure out how I missed the old woman boarding or the stealthy arrival of the bus, but I stepped forward and held out my hand to be stamped. I couldn't understand the need for a stamp as the bus was free, but I didn't want to question anything for the sake of a little warmth and a free lift home. As the driver stamped my hand, I told him where I lived and asked him to drop me wherever was closest. He simply lifted his hand and pointed towards the back of the bus without any eye contact whatsoever. I headed to the seating section still shivering, and sure enough the old woman was sitting up front just behind the driver's seat, still humming to herself. The bus was exceptionally warm for a bus of its age and quite full for a late service especially one I'd never heard of. There was only one empty seat at the very back of the bus, so I headed towards it. As I passed the other people on the bus, I realized that it wasn't carrying the typical post-midnight passengers that I'd expect to see at 3 a.m. Filling the old cloth seats on the bus were what looked like businessmen, workers, and a couple families with kids. It was strange. I mean, who brings children on a late bus service? Is that even legal on a school night? I don't know. I just couldn't make heads or tails of the situation. Everyone on the old rickety bus was silent except for the old woman who continuously hummed softly. I still found her warm and pleasant until I realized that every single passenger I passed was staring directly at her seat with a horrified expression plastered on their shadow grazed faces. It was as if they were scared of her, but the old woman seemed completely unaware that that kind of attention was being directed at her. On top of that, none of the other passengers had even acknowledged my presence. I also noticed that the bus heavily smelled like smoke and ash. The staunch stench was so strong that it stung my septum. I put it out of my mind best I could. As I continued towards the last empty seat, I began to wonder if there had been an altercation before I got on the bus. I stopped in front of one of the seats and asked a man who looked like a 70s dad if everything was okay, but I only got two words out before the driver interrupted me. This bus can't leave till you sit down in your seat. Now find a seat and sit down in it. The level of hot rage in his voice caused me to whip around in the aisle to face the front of the bus. The driver had turned around in his seat and was glaring into my eyes. His face was twisted in hatred. He bared his teeth with bulging eyes and his head shook with anger. He showed so much violent emotion, yet he remained unnaturally silent after his outburst. The old woman stopped humming but continued to face forward. My confusion level peaked when I saw that every passenger on the bus was staring at me with a look of stewed wrath. As I slowly walked to the back of the bus, their eyes followed me as I approached my seat. It felt so awkward. I looked back at the driver and the other passengers. I'm... Uh, I'm sorry for holding everyone up, I muttered. All the other people on board the late bus quickly snapped their heads back around to the front. I sat down embarrassed as the dark bus drove away from the stop. I stared out the window and watched the woods pass by as I wondered where we were. I thought my house couldn't have been too far away, but I found nothing familiar about my surroundings. I wondered if we were even heading in the right direction. After 10 or 15 minutes, I grew anxious so I decided to ask the driver how close we were to my stop. I shouted my question up the aisle, but it was met with silence. I waited for a few minutes and spoke up again, louder this time. No response. I asked the woman in front of me where the final bus stop was. She slowly turned her head and whispered, Get off the bus! I sunk back in my seat, 
Something wasn't right about this late bus. I was about to stand up and go ask the driver where the hell we were going when I noticed that the old woman at the front was gone and every passenger was staring back at me with a look of disdain. At this point I wanted the bus to stop and just let me off. I didn't really care where. I kept looking out the window in hopes of a familiar area but I knew that we'd been driving for way too long. There was nothing but trees and blackness. Suddenly I spotted a light in the distance. I wasn't sure what it was but I was definitely getting off at whatever structure those lights were stationed at because this was all way too fucking weird for my taste. I didn't know where these people were from but it was pretty clear that they didn't like me. Plus the smell of smoke seemed to be getting stronger. It was choking the back of my throat. Suddenly the bus driver started to giggle uncontrollably for no reason. I had totally had enough weird shit for one night. Hey, driver, can you let me off at the, at the lights? That, that's my stop. I shouted loudly from the back of the bus. The driver just continued to giggle as he slowly stopped the bus in the middle of the road. He then turned around and began to stare at me like the other passengers were doing. None of them even blinked. My voice cracked as I said, No, I meant, can you let me off, like, further on up, like, closer to the lights? Hello? The second I finished my sentence, the passengers began to giggle softly along with the driver. Hey, what the fuck is going on here? Why have we stopped and why is everyone giggling? I screamed, starting to panic. This isn't funny! And that's when I heard the old woman's humming. But she still wasn't in her seat. She sounded closer. Too close. I looked to my left and was startled to find her sitting right beside me. Hey, whoa, fuck! What the fuck, man? The giggling stopped, but everyone continued to stare at me. We're almost there. The old woman whispered, smiling through her aged, cracked brown teeth. I was so caught off guard that I nearly jumped through the window on my right. The old woman put her hand on my lap and silently pulled out a small rusty hatchet just before she slid down into the darkness below the seat she was sitting in. Hey, hey she's got a... she's a... she's got a... fuck! I said, rising to my feet and jumping up to stand on top of my seat. Everyone started laughing like they were going insane. I didn't know what to do. I was in complete shock. A second or two later, an aging arm wielding the hatchet rose up behind the heads of the male and female passengers in front of me. And without warning, it came crashing down into their backs repeatedly. The victims laughed even harder as blood shot out of their mouths and peppered my face with each cackle. I watched the bloody hatchet bounce from one side to the other, delivering a crushing blow to each of the two laughing people in turns back and forward until they were no longer making any sounds. Their lifeless bodies continued to grin as they lay bleeding in their seats. It all happened so fast. I couldn't believe my fucking guys, and my body wouldn't move. My knees shook with fear as the whole bus began laughing again. The old woman rose up from the dark floor in the aisle next to the couple that she'd just slaughtered, raised her hatchet high in the air, and jumped on the guy in the next seat thrashing him over and over as the mass giggling turned into a full-on bus full of hysterical laughter. My body finally kicked back into gear and I ran up the aisle of the bus, but I didn't get far easily. The crazy passengers began to reach out and grab for me as I passed their seats. I had to fight like hell to get away from them. They were so strong. During the struggle, I looked back at the old woman a few times and she was butchering everyone, one by one, getting closer and closer as I swatted at the hands reaching out for me. I kicked and punched and shoved to tear myself away from the crazy people, and I was almost out of the bus when a hand got a good grip on me. It was the driver. Let me off the bus, man. Get your... Hey. Get your fucking hands did, off did me! I tell you? Fuck! Let, let go Sit me. out of your seat! He roared in between crazy fits of laughter. His skin appeared to be melting. I didn't know what the fuck was going on. With a final burst of strength, 
I got out of the driver's grasp and fell out of the door, landing hard on my back on the cold asphalt. Let me through! <laughs> you fucking, you hey, fucking come psycho! Come back! Come back! Yeah. Oh. 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 We do this all the time! Go fuck yourself! Wall of blood! The bus doors closed and the bus started up. <laughs> As it drove away, a huge flame engulfed the entire bus. I could hear horrific muffled screams coming from inside the vehicle until it was no longer in sight. I laid on the ground for several minutes. I couldn't breathe. I was having a panic attack. I just couldn't process anything. And I still can't. Who could? A few minutes later, I heard a massive metal smack in the distance and something that sounded like an explosion. I jumped up to my feet, wondering what else could possibly happen to me that night. And that's when it dawned on me that the bus must have crashed. I ran as fast as I could towards the lights in the distance. As I neared the lit up structure, I realized what it was. It, it was... It was where I work. The straightway 24-hour diner. I was back. But how the hell was that even possible? It couldn't have been. Physically and emotionally drained, I bursted through the diner's double doors and shouted for my co-workers to call the police as I collapsed and slid down the back side of the door. I began to cry uncontrollably due to confusion and relief. And from there, I blacked in and out of consciousness. I remember everyone being around me, asking me questions, bringing me glass of water after glass of water, covering me with blankets, and even giving me heated gloves. But all I could say over and over was, She, 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 she killed them on the bus. I noticed in the diner's bar mirror that the blood that had been laughed up in my face on the bus was mysteriously gone. Then my manager dropped a bombshell. He told me that they had been worried about me because I hadn't shown up for work in two days. But I told him that that was bullshit. I'd just left work an hour or two ago. I still had on my uniform. But he assured me that he was right when he showed me the date on a newspaper. No one had seen me for two days. Where was I for 48 hours? I had no answers for my absence. When the police finally came, I was still shocked out, but I had calmed down quite a bit after coming to terms with the fact that, at that point, I was safe. As safe as I could be, anyway. I told the two officers my story and asked them to check the road past the curve because I thought I heard what sounded like a crash in that direction. But what the older officer told me chilled my spine. The color drained from my face in disbelief as I listened to him speak. Sitting in a booth across from me, he told me that there was no crash. At least not tonight. And not in the two nights prior, either. But there was one almost 50 years ago in the early 70s. It happened just at the curve past the diner in February of 72. And lo and behold, it was a bus crash. Apparently, an old bus went off the road and crashed into the trees. No one ever knew the exact cause of the crash. The bus caught fire due to a gas explosion, and that sent the forest up in flames. Every single person inside the bus was burned alive. It took firemen two full days to control the flames. Local county buses used to have a policy that if the bus was ever late by over 30 minutes, the journey was free to all passengers on board for that round of travel. But obviously, that meant someone was getting fired. It was theorized that the driver was speeding because he was late due to having to make an unprecedented stop to pick up an old woman that lived in the woods off a gravel road near an old forgotten bus stop. Apparently, the bus stop no longer exists. While no foul play was ever investigated relating to the incident, there was one small detail that no one but the investigators knew about. They said the fire was so bad that the only material that survived the heat was the metal, bone fragments of the passengers, and a small old dull hatchet. No one ever figured out who it belonged to. 
I don't know who believed me and who thought I was crazy or what, but regardless, that was all the facts I ever got on the matter. The old cop told me it sounded like I may have experienced what locals to the straight like to call an echo. It's kinda like a ghost memory. He said if I believe in that sort of thing, I should look it up. Other than that, there was no case. The officers gave me a lift to my house. I racked my brain as I sat alone in my home, trying to make sense of things. I was so exhausted, but still too tired to sleep. My patchy memory raced as I attempted to retrace the events that, apparently, took place over two days, not a couple of hours. I started to wonder if any of that madness actually even happened. I thought maybe I was going crazy or perhaps I'd blacked out or something, but it was no use. I couldn't think and I couldn't stop thinking. I put my head in my hands realizing that I was still wearing the gloves I was given at the diner. I was only beginning to feel comfortably warm again. I was lucky I didn't die of hypothermia. I pulled off the gloves and tossed them aside. And that's when I saw it. It read, Straightway Bus Service, Route 44, February 29th, 1972. Delayed. It was the bus stamp. The ink was blood red. I woke up in a hot sweat. I was winded and my heart was pounding like it wanted out of my chest. It was as if it was kicking the inside of my ribcage trying to force its way out. I couldn't control my breathing. I felt as though I'd been holding my breath for a very long time. Babe, are you okay? You're soaking wet. My wife said, placing the back of her hand on my forehead. And you're roasting. We need to check your temperature. She uttered with urgency as she tossed back the blanket and rushed out of bed. I'll be okay, I said as she disappeared into the bathroom. I heard her rummaging around my cabinet for a few moments before appearing back at my side and sticking the temp gun in my ear. Beep beep. 94.5, uh, I guess you're okay, she said puzzled. Told ya. It was just a stupid nightmare, I said reassuring her that I was okay. Again? You've been having them all week, she replied. I looked at her as a bead of sweat ran down my forehead. I was confused. Have I? When did I have a nightmare? I asked. You've been waking up like this every night. Don't you remember? She questioned, placing her delicate hand on my shoulder and looking deep into my eyes. No, I, I really don't. I just remember... I stopped to recollect memory fragments. What? She begged. I remember... The breeze... And lights... Bright lights... I think I was about to be hit by a car. I, I don't know. It was a dream, I told her. Well, thank God it was just a dream. Must be the same bad dream you've been having all week, she said, getting up from the bed. Where are you going? I asked her. It's 7 a.m. I have to clean that house over on Rose Claire today. That's at 9 o'clock. I've got to get ready, she answered. Where the hell is Rose Claire? And why is it still dark outside? I asked her, rubbing my eyes. It's just that time of the year, darling. You're not used to being up this early, she replied. Ugh, then why am I? I muttered, rolling back over and pulling the blanket around myself. You're up early because you start a new job today. Eight o'clock, she said, yanking the blanket off me and tossing it to the floor. Now get up and let's have breakfast together for once. You know, like a couple's supposed to do. Damn, she was right. How had I forgotten that? I was starting a new job. I was still tempted to go back to sleep, but I quickly got up and began to get myself ready. After breakfast, I kissed my wife and left the house. Our neighborhood was quiet, the traffic was calm, and the skies were blue. I drove out to a wooded plot on the edge of town. It was smack dab in the middle of nowhere. I kinda got the feeling I was going the wrong way, but just as I was about to turn back, there it was. A big white two-story building with tinted windows and a single white door in the middle. It was just on the other side of a massive empty parking lot. As I approached the door, I noticed that the word Heritage was written on it. Must be the name of the company I work for, I thought. I couldn't remember. I didn't care either. I rang the little white buzzer next to the intercom and the door immediately popped open. Welcome to Heritage. Come on in. 
The intercom speaker blared, catching me off guard. Oh, oh, okay, thanks. I answered back, opening the door and entering my new workplace for the first time. Once I was inside, the door clicked shut behind me. As my eyes adjusted to the fluorescent light, I saw the receptionist sitting behind a large wooden curved table. Her eyes were fixed on the computer screen in front of her. She was typing a mile a minute. The attractive young woman seemed pleasant. Her gentle smile never changed as she paused to proofread her work. She then continued typing. I walked towards her. When I got to her area, she picked up her desk phone and chirped, He's here, before quickly hanging up the receiver. She never stopped typing with her other hand, and she didn't even look at me. She's good, I thought. Her name tag read Jill. Before I could introduce myself to Jill the receptionist, I heard my name being called. I don't know, Liz. <laughs> I turned around to see a gray-haired man in a dark black suit cheerfully walking towards me. It's so very good to meet you. I'm Richard. I'm the head of the mothership around here. We're excited you joined our team. Welcome. Richard seemed pleasant, too. He stuck out his hand. I shook it. It seemed like the right thing to do. Follow me. <laughs> he chuckled, leading me through a blue door into a large white room with short, clean blue carpet. There were about 50 cubicles in the white room. There was nothing special about them. They were your typical office cubicles. In each cubicle, there was a person in a black suit either on the phone or typing. Just like Jill the receptionist, they all seemed pleasant. Not one of them was without a smile pasted on their faces. Richard turned towards the cubicles and spoke loudly. Employees of Heritage, allow me to introduce the newest member of our family, Mr. Adam Nolis. Everyone stopped what they were doing and stared at me silently for a few seconds before clapping and cheering like I'd won something. Richard patted me on the back at the same time and it nearly knocked me off my feet. What a warm reception. I couldn't help but smile and giggle a little. I was tempted to make a speech, but I didn't. When everyone went back to what they were doing, I turned to Richard. What are these people on? I whispered jokingly. Nothing, Adam. They just like working for Heritage. It's safe, it's inclusive, and it's home. Keeping your workplace likened to a home is what makes a team a family. That's why our company motto is, Heritage is where the home is. He said, gesturing to a mural on the wall we were standing in front of. I felt like I was going to fit in well at Heritage. Richard led me through the room to a light beige door at the end of it. I could see my name on the panel fastened to it. Mr. Nolis, this is your office. Now, I know you applied for a normal position here at Heritage, but I'm all out of desks on the main floor. So how would you like to be promoted to supervisor? He asked, grinning ear to ear, staring at me unblinkingly. What? Supervisor? Wow. Already? I asked in shock that I'd just been promoted, not five minutes after walking through the company door. Sure, it's an easy job that comes with an adequate pay raise that I think you'll like the sight of. Richard chirped, opening the door to my new office. Well, take a seat, he urged, motioning me towards a big brown leather chair behind a massive, expensive-looking desk. I walked over and sat down. It was super comfortable. A perfect fit. Richard turned on my computer screen and loaded up the Heritage Work application. Staring at the screen blankly, I quickly realized that I didn't actually know what I was supposed to be doing. I wasn't clear on what my job description was at that point. I was embarrassed, but I needed to ask Richard what my tasks were. But before I could speak up, he did. You're probably wondering what you need to do. And let me tell you, Adam, it's simple. The phone will ring. You answer the call and you say, Heritage is where the home is. I'm Mr. Nolis. How can I help you? The customer will give you their account number and order either red or blue. Then they'll give you the quantity of their order. Key that information into the application on your computer screen and then hit enter. After that, just wait for the next call. It's easy. Any questions? I had questions, but I was happy enough with such a light workload and a first day job promotion that I happily confirmed that I was now clear on the work that needed done. With that, Richard bid me farewell and told me to contact reception if I needed anything. Then, he left. I could hear the happy chatty team out in the main floor handling calls. I guessed I was kind of their boss at that point. Or something like that. I wasn't sure how I was supposed to supervise them, but then again, I didn't want to complain and end up with more work for the same pay, so I waited for the phone to ring. 
and it did. Heritage is where the home is. I'm Mr. Nolis. What can I do for you? I asked when I picked up the ringing phone. 341, 982, red, 98. The hushed caller said quickly. I keyed in the details and hit enter. Okay, got it. Thanks for... I didn't get to finish. They hung up. I put the receiver down and waited for the next caller. It took a few minutes for the phone to ring again, but when it did, I answered it just as I had before. 421, 893, blue, 42. The voice said, I chuckled as I keyed in the info and pressed enter. You know, that reminds me of a football play. Blue for- The caller was gone before I completed my sentence. Odd. So unfriendly and so rushed for no reason. What a fun job, I thought. Easy money, though. So I cast the thought aside. Then the phone rang again. 284, 193, red, 19. Then they hung up, and the phone rang again. 491, 328, blue, 8. Then it rang again. Then again, this went on for some time. It felt like hours had passed. I wasn't sure because there was no clock in my office and I must have left my phone in the car. I checked the computer screen, but it didn't display the time anywhere. I wanted to connect to the internet, but I couldn't minimize the heritage working application. Strange. I started to get thirsty. I needed a drink. Just as I thought about getting up from my desk to fetch a pail of water, the phone rang. It was Jill. Richard asked me to see if you need anything. Something to drink, perhaps? She asked. Um, yeah, sure. I I was just about to... I mean, yeah, I'd love some water, please. I replied. No problem. I'll send some in now. She answered and hung up the phone. By the time I hung up on my end, there was a knock at the door. I shouted for the person to come in. It was Jill. She was carrying an empty glass in one hand and a big pitcher of ice water mixed with lime and fresh mint in the other. She set them down on my desk with that same smile she wore at reception. I thanked her. She nodded her head politely and left, closing my office door behind her. I poured myself a glass of the water and drank it. It was beautiful. Crystal clear, tasty, and freezing cold. It quenched my thirst immediately. As soon as I set the empty glass down, the phone rang. 319, 248, blue, 24. I keyed in the data and hung up the phone. This went on and on. Hours passed, and then more hours. At least I think. The calls didn't stop. I took the receiver off and placed it on the table. I needed a break. I didn't even know what time it was. Had I worked through lunch? There were no windows. I felt like I had been in that room forever. I poured another glass of the tasty water and pressed it to my lips. It was still freezing cold. But how? I inspected the pitcher. The ice hadn't melted. There wasn't even any condensation on the pitcher or the glass. It couldn't have been possible. I got up and walked over to the door. I opened it just a crack so I could observe the main floor. I could still hear everyone bustling away on their phones and computer keyboards from the cubicles. I guessed it wasn't time to go home yet. Everyone was still there. So I closed the door and sat back down at my desk. As soon as I put the office phone back on the hook, it rang. Hi, it's Jill. Is everything okay? You haven't taken a call in 3.8 minutes and your phone line's been busy. Can I get you anything? She asked. Oh, no, Jill. Uh, I just needed a break from the calls. Hey, by the way, did we skip lunch? How long have I been working in here? I feel like I've been in here forever. I asked, puzzled. Your lunch is inside your desk, top drawer. It's provided by Heritage. Would you like me to transfer your calls for a few minutes while you eat? I opened the drawer. An apple. Hmm. It looked nice. I was tempted to take a bite, but I wasn't hungry. As a matter of fact, I wasn't hungry at all. I had zero appetite. I thought it was strange because I love food and I'd been in there so long, but I didn't pay it much mind. No, Jill, I think I'm okay for food, but maybe I could take a few minutes to just collect my thoughts. I mean, I think these numbers have gone to my head. I told her. No problem. Take ten, and then please continue to receive calls. They're piling up. She said and then hung up the phone. Ten? Couldn't I at least get a fifteen minute break? I mean, I am the supervisor after all. I wanted to call Jill back, but I realized my office phone had no numbers on it. I couldn't use it to dial out. I sat at my desk for about a minute staring at the computer screen. I could see a list of all the calls I had taken that day. Every order I had received... There were thousands. 
I didn't remember answering and keying in information for that many calls. I scrolled up to the top of the list. 341, 982 red. 98, 321, 893 blue. 42, 284, 193 red 19. 491, 328 blue 8. 849, 123 red 12. Wait a minute, I thought. Something didn't add up. First of all, the colors. Red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. They alternated back and forth every time throughout the entire list. Then I looked closer at the numbers. It was the same numbers in different orders every single time. 341, 982, with the 98 being in the 982. It was the same as the next one. 421, 893, with the 42 being part of the 421. All the numbers were the same. What the hell was going on? The phone rang. I picked it up and left it off the hook before jumping up and quickly heading towards the door. Then it hit me. I didn't remember applying for this job. Where did I apply? How much was I supposed to be making? And why don't I remember my interview? Then I realized I couldn't remember the date or even what day it was. Confusion sat deep in my mind. The number, the ice, the calls, the colors, the missing details. Something didn't make sense. Nothing made sense. I slowly opened my office door and crept out. The main floor was quiet. I approached the cubicles and peeked over the top. The people. They were frozen in their spots, unmoving. Like they were stuck in the middle of the last action they attempted without completing it. Every one of them were either on the phone or typing something on the keyboard. I was tempted to touch one of the people, but I didn't. Hello? I muttered to the guy in the cubicle closest to me. Nothing. Then suddenly, without warning, they all started moving and talking again like nothing was wrong. I stared at them. They didn't seem to notice me. That's when I realized that all of them were talking, but none of them were actually saying anything. They weren't making any sense. It was just random babblings that sounded like speech, but the office workers weren't actually using words. I went into the cubicles. They were all using the same heritage program as me. They were doing the same job I was. And the numbers, they were the same too. I knew for sure at that moment I had to get out of that place. I made my way to the door where the receptionist was and walked through. Jill looked up at me with that same smile. Mr. Nolis, the calls are... I cut her off. I need to speak to Richard immediately, I demanded. Mr. Nolis, I'm afraid he's busy at the minute, she said, never once losing that smile. Now listen, Jill, I don't know what the deal is around here, but I quit, okay? I quit. This place gives me the creeps, I told her nervously. Mr. Nolis, would you like something to drink? You seem to be experiencing a high amount of stress. She chirped. No, no more water. No more numbers. No more crazy shit. I'm out of here. I explained as I walked towards the front door of the building. I tried the handle. The door was locked. As I stood facing it, I demanded that Jill open the door. I was even tempted to kick it open, but I didn't. Only Richard can open that door. She said, smiling but not moving. She stared at me. She never even blinked. No one in that building seemed to blink. There were stairs to the right of her desk. I quickly walked towards them. Oh, okay. I'll go get him. Is this where he is? Is Richard's office up here? I'll go find out. You can't go up there, Mr. Nolis. Floor 2 is restricted. Your job is down here on floor 1. She said pleasantly. Sue me, I whispered and continued. As I ran up the stairs, I heard Jill calling for security. She never lost her pleasant tone. The stairs were long with a big metal door at the top of them. When I reached the door in front of me, I opened it and walked through onto floor two. It was nothing like the first floor. It was like a house. A massive family house with clothes everywhere and toys cluttering the place. It was a disaster. Every room was in need of a vacuum cleaner, mop, and a feather duster. And that was only the tip of the iceberg. Richard? I called out. No response. I walked through the house following the sound of old-style music until I got to the kitchen. It was even messier than the other rooms I passed. There were dishes everywhere, food leftovers, tied-up trash bags. It was horrendous. Standing at the sink next to an unbelievable pile of dishes was the maid. She was scrubbing so frantically. It looked like she was trying her best to clean a very dirty pot or pan. The music continued to blare from an old radio in the kitchen. To the right of the maid was a pile of dishes that I assumed she had already cleaned. They were all red and blue, alternating evenly. Red, blue, 
Red. Blue. Just like the numbers. Ma'am? Uh, I'm looking for Richard. The answer I got back was haunting. Adam? The maid said. But I knew that voice. It was my wife. Adam, I've been here for days. The work doesn't end. Evelyn? What the hell are you doing here? I said, reaching out to touch her shoulder. I looked into the sink. The water. It was red. Blood red. Evelyn, honey, what's going on? I asked, gently turning her towards me. The horror hit me in the face like a cold brick of ice. Her hands were worn down to the knuckles in her palms. They were dripping with blood. Shredded flesh hung off them and I could see her bones in her hands. She was shaking with fear and bloodshot eyes. Evelyn, we have to go. I trembled, grabbing her arm and pulling her with me. We hurried through the house until we found a window in what looked like the living room. I opened it. Evelyn was in shock. We had to get out of Heritage fast. Then I heard something. Mr. Nolis, where are you going? The numbers. I spun around. It was Richard. But he was distorted and his appearance was immediately malignant in just about every way possible. His skin was swollen and drooping. He could barely perch up the fake little smile on his face. He looked so deformed. Sharp teeth were poking through his mouth and he was hunched over like a monster. Everything was wrong. He was a nightmare, and his evil intentions were obvious. He meant us harm. You need to learn to follow orders, Adam. You can't keep running away. You must obey. He sneered as several other men in black suits gathered behind him. I grabbed Evelyn and pulled her closer to the open window, looking at the state of my wife. I was tempted to jump. We don't have a choice. We have to do it. I told her as Richard and the men dashed towards us. We threw ourselves out of the window just in time. I remember falling. I remember the air. It was almost dark and we were falling from so high up. It was as if we had jumped out of an airplane. When I caught a glimpse of the building, it wasn't a building. I was tumbling so I didn't get a great look at it, but it was some kind of aircraft. Something I'd never seen before. The evil version of Richard was watching me from the window still smiling. He got smaller and smaller and smaller. We were going to die. I just knew it. Then suddenly there was light. Nothing but light. And we stopped falling. I woke up in a hot sweat. I was winded and my heart was pounding like it wanted out of my chest. It was as if it was kicking the inside of my ribcage trying to force its way out. I couldn't control my breathing. I felt as though I'd been holding my breath for a very long time. Another one? You've been having nightmares all week, Evelyn said, wiping the sweat from my forehead. I sat up in bed. Have I? When? I asked. You've been waking up like this every night. Don't you remember? She said, looking deep into my eyes. No, I just remember the breeze and lights. Bright lights. Well, at least you're awake and safe now. It worries me when you have these nightmares. I think you should see a doctor. I rolled my eyes, chuckled, and then laid back down in bed. Oh, and don't forget, you start your new job today. Eight o'clock, she said. I quickly sat up and looked at her. She caught me off guard. Damn. She was right. How had I forgotten about my new job? I was tempted to roll over and go back to sleep, but I didn't. It started slow. No one even realized what was happening. By the time the gravity of our predicament pressed its full weight against our comprehension, it was far too late to turn back. Society as we knew it collapsed before our very eyes as rage consumed our hearts and thoughts. It happened in front of our faces right under our stuck-up noses for years as we hid behind the backside of little cameras built into the screens that controlled our lives from the palms of our hands. We saw what was going on around us, but we didn't pay any attention to the signs, at least not the right kind of attention. I remember the first time I witnessed a public meltdown. I was in the line at the grocery store waiting to pay for a bottle of soda. It was hot outside, and the AC must have been out of action in this particular store because I felt like I was in a sauna. 
There were about three full shopping carts ahead of me at the register, and only one checkout lane open. Typical. I just kept hoping that someone in line would notice that I was only buying a cold drink and, you know, let me go in front of them. But my wishful thinking was silently rejected, so I had no choice other than to wait. I was sweating like a pig. We all were. Even the cashier. In the heat of the moment, I twisted off the cap of the unpaid bottle in my hands and sank the whole thing down in one gulp. My thirst was quenched for sure, but there I was, waiting in line to pay for an empty plastic bottle. Inconvenient, sure, but what could I do? A blonde lady at the front of the aisle was trying to pay for her bags, but the card reader kept rejecting her American Express. I could see she was getting flustered with the technology. She'd tried the card several times and I could tell other people in line were getting impatient. I started feeling bad for the woman when the cashier asked if she'd like to try another card or pay with cash. And that's when the whole situation began to escalate from all angles. The blonde woman dropped her purse as her hands fell lifelessly to her sides. She pointed her face up towards the ceiling, dropped her jaw, and released the most agonizing, inhuman scream I'd ever heard. It was the sound of pure, raging, anguish. The whole store froze as my blood ran cold. Ma'am, are you okay? The trembling cashier asked the blonde lady, but she didn't respond. She just stood there staring up at the ceiling, quietly mumbling to herself. Ma'am, I'm sorry. If you can't pay for your items, I can put them aside for you and you can come back and pick them up later today when you figure out your situation. Is that okay? Or do you want to try another card? The cashier asked again. No reply. Hey crazy lady, pay for your stuff or take a hike, said an Italian-American man in his mid to late forties. He was standing directly behind the woman waiting in line with his wife. His wife slapped him on the arm and shot him a dirty look. Hey, what the hell was that for? He asked, glaring at his wife and rubbing his arm. That? She barked, slapping him in the other arm. It's for your complete lack of compassion towards others. The Italian guy was beginning to lose his cool with his wife. Lack of compassion? What are you talking about? This E.T. phone home brought over here is holding everybody up, and I don't know if you noticed or not, but it's hot. Hey, Karen of the Body Snatches, I haven't got all day. Move it. I lose it. The blonde lady didn't budge, but I noticed she was drooling and her face seemed to be getting more and more red by the second. Ma'am, hello? The cashier called out again. No response. What a lunatic, said the husband as he pushed forward and started emptying the items in his cart onto the black moving belt. You know, this is the problem with these new people and their wokeness. It's a disease infecting the dumbest and dullest in society. <laughs> And now, this shit is the mess the rest of us have to live through. Robert! Snapped his wife, but Robert wasn't having it. No, don't give me any more shit. I'm standing here in this microwave of a fucking place, sweating my balls off, just trying to keep my cool. Ain't that what you call a paradox? I just want to pay for my shit and get the hell out of here. They can deal with the walking dead after they take care of me. I am so embarrassed. His wife muttered, looking back at me with sad eyes. I shook my head no to signal that everything was okay and save her from an ounce of the shame that she uncomfortably wore on her face. Honestly, it's fine. I whispered, smiling through the heat. Her husband snapped his fingers twice at the cashier before asking in a demanding tone. Hey you, cheerleader, can you ring up my stuff so I can leave before Silent Hill over here releases the monsters? I mean, I feel like the sirens could happen at any minute. Oh, I wish I could. She replied to Robert. But I need to cancel her order first, or she needs to pay for it. Ma'am, excuse me, hello? Robert had had enough, I guess. He took a few steps towards the woman and aggressively tapped her on the shoulder. Hello, McFly? Anybody home? Look, you dropped your meds. You might need those today. He bent down to pick up a prescription pill bottle that had rolled out of the woman's purse when she dropped it, and that's when escalation reached atomic levels. The situation literally exploded. Before Robert could stand back up to his feet, the strange woman pounced on him and pinned his body to the tiled ground of the grocery store. She was absolutely vicious in her attack, screaming and clawing at his face and eyes with pure malevolent intent. 
Robert struggled with the woman, but even though she was half his size, he was no match for her in the state she was in. I was witnessing boiling rage, and I couldn't move. Robert's wife and other people in the store tried to pry the mad woman off of him, but for some reason no one could stop her. She shoved them away with such force that an elderly man was badly injured in the process of helping Robert, whose face was now covered in blood. While the hysterical cashier called 911 in a panic and pleaded with the operator for help, all I could do was watch in complete horror. As the attacked man unsuccessfully tried to defend himself from the woman, his wife cried out in terror begging for someone to help. But the crazed woman straddling her husband didn't even appear human anymore. Nor did Robert's torn up bloody face. Skin hung from beneath the blonde woman's nails as she grabbed fistfuls of his hair and began to smash her head into his at such force that her own teeth were flying out of her broken mouth. She repeated this over and over and over again until neither her nor Robert were any longer recognizable. Then the woman raised her head one last time, and with an angry howl of pure rage, she crashed her face downwards into what was left of Robert's. Neither one of them were moving after that apart from light, involuntary jerks from dying nerves. It was hard to tell where her head ended, and his started. It was a sight I'll never forget. That was four years ago before the planet became one big world star moment. Back before we realized what the public freakouts, meltdown moments, and NPC Kevins and Karens really were. Before we knew that it wasn't just mental health. Before we were aware of the K-Rage virus. It started with the public freakouts that everyone thought was so funny. And slowly, YouTube became one big compilation of those kind of videos. Pretty soon, that mixed in with cases of excited delirium, and it wasn't long until there was no difference. Mixed compilations of comical meltdowns soon became worrying trends of violent altercations. Not just here, all across the world. Simply put, Karens and Kevins were no longer funny. They were a threat to our very way of life. K-Rage broke out without anyone's knowledge. It wasn't like a zombie apocalypse movie. In fact, it was nothing like that. It progressed gradually. It took years for us to realize what happened. But at that stage, it was too late. By the time we knew what was up, everyone had contracted the virus and anyone was capable of melting down with extreme violence. Karen and Kevin were inside us all and we all held the potential to become a walking natural disaster in seconds. So how does it happen? I guess it all depends on your internal waves of rage. What makes you tick? Is it words? Sounds? Pain? Whatever it is, you have to be very careful not to become triggered, because if you do, it can cost people their lives. Not just others, but your own life too. Melting down, or K-raging as we call it, isn't as simple as just losing control for a moment. Think of it as a possession where anger is the demon in control. If you trigger, you're no longer you. And in the middle of an episode, shit can get pretty dark real quick. I once saw a K-raging husband squeeze his wife's jaws together so hard that he shattered her lower mandible obliterated her teeth and dented the top of her head. Why? He was triggered by her smacking her lips at a restaurant. I saw a mother at a bus stop eating the face off her newborn baby because it wouldn't stop crying. And I've seen unborn babies eat their way out of their mother in a rage. I've watched people rip their pets in half and stomp their elderly parents into the sidewalk with such force that the K-Rager's legs were almost liquefied by the repeated impact. And even then, they continued to rage out. That's just a handful of the stuff I've witnessed. I've lost track of how many times I've watched people dive out of windows or jump off buildings to avoid a K-Rage fit. And yet none of this stuff I've mentioned is anywhere near the worst of it. 
It became obvious from the videos on YouTube and Facebook that the meltdowns were lasting longer and longer. It was as if someone in the middle of a fit just couldn't get themselves under control. As a matter of fact, the average cooldown period for a K-Rage fit is roughly three days. That's a 72-hour meltdown with no guarantees on the other side of it. Hopefully, the person will eventually collapse with exhaustion. At that time, the K-Rage will release its hold. It takes about another three days for the cooled-down K-Rager to physically recover. K-Raging is taxing on the body. It leaves people feeling like they've been hit by a train. There are K-Rage detention centers and virus squads that respond to reports of K-Ragers, but they only help if they get there in time. When they do, they detain and facilitate people until they cool down. Padded rooms, constraint nets, drugs, electroshock, all of these previously inhumane methods are now a necessary means of protecting people from each other and from themselves. It's a desperate world I live in. You see, someone may K-rage and go too far, killing themselves by using their body to inflict damage on their surroundings is the most common way this happens, but sometimes people just can't cool down. Like ever, those sorry sons of bitches simply never come back and remain forever trapped in a K-rage fit until they either starve or die of thirst, and the only thing a K-Rager will eat is the flesh of the living. People, animals, whatever they can get their hands on. One of the most terrifying things you can ever witness is a K-Rager igniting other K-Rage meltdowns around you. Try keeping your cool when that happens. I mean, it's a rare occurrence, but when it happens, it's like a mob of raging, moralless people. Headbutting and biting are common traits of a K-raging mob, just like our supermarket Karen. But imagine that, and a crowd. It's crazy that one K-rager can trigger another, and that can trigger a stampede of K-ragers that we call a rage mob. Why does this happen? I've been told it's to do with the fight-or-flight response. It's believed that fear and aggression are closely linked. This in turn causes a chain reaction that you never want to be anywhere near. The government made a drug that's supposed to help us keep things under control. It doesn't cure the rage, but it sure helps to prevent a lot of it. There are signs everywhere and reminders for everyone to take their PRC tablets. And pretty much everyone does. We don't have a choice. We don't have many options. For anything. There's no emotion anymore. No surprises, no shocks, no angry music, no contact sports, no debates, no democracy. No, nothing. All things of the past. We can't control our rage while those things exist. Freedom, it seems, is a primary source of rage. Feeling anything that isn't recommended anymore is illegal. And that's why we have the PRC meds. PRC stands for Please remain calm. But I'm afraid I can't anymore. I locked my K-raging wife and daughter in the basement. I'm not even sure why they triggered. It all happened so fast. I hoped that in three days they'd still be alive. I chained them to opposite walls. But judging by the banging sound on the basement door, I guess the chains weren't effective. It's been five days since I left them down there. I wonder who's on the other side of the door. I wonder who survived. If you can call it that. It doesn't matter. There's only one option left. Please remain calm. <laughs> Daddy, what happened to Mommy? Can I come out? I'm scared. Daddy? The basement is strictly off limits. Original Creepy Pasta Scary Stories by Mr. Black Pasta.
The cardboard sign had been nailed to the heavy wooden door for about as long as I could remember. Dad fixed it there when I was about three, shortly after Mom's miscarriage. Osiris was only about a year old back then, and from then on, I was no longer allowed in the basement. By the time I was eight and Osiris was six, I couldn't even remember what it looked like down there. The door to the basement had a giant chained padlock on the front and, as far as I knew, Dad was the only one with the key. I don't even think my mom had access. And as for me, well, I was told not to even think about going down there. I wasn't even permitted to speak about the basement below the house I grew up in. Questioning the basement rule carried consequences. Horrific consequences. Osiris was a big boy. He was intimidating to strangers, but he was very kind and gentle with me. I'm not exactly sure what kind of dog he was, but when I'd ask my mom what breed he was, she'd just say, Giant. And that was that. He was massive and super protective, especially when it came to me and mom. He loved mom. He was my best friend. But Osiris was obedient only to dad. If my father told him to lay down, Osiris would do as he was told, and he wouldn't dare move until dad said so. My big dog protected me from dangers and kept me safe. I watched him bravely rip a rattlesnake in half in our backyard once. I was playing on my swing set, aimlessly swinging as high as I could, attempting to peek over the privacy fence my dad had built. I rarely got a glimpse out of our backyard, but if I swung high enough, I could see the big field leading to the woods. Sometimes I'd even spot a deer or a rabbit. It was like my own safari. It was what I did for fun. But on this day, Without warning, I suddenly heard the sound of a rattler's tail vibrating on the ground just beneath me. I looked down. There it was. A massive diamond back in a striking pose. In an instant, I couldn't feel my body. I couldn't blink. I wanted to cry, but fear had plugged my tear ducts. Terror had consumed me. All I could feel were the tiny hairs that covered my skin standing at full attention like danger receptors. I held on for dear life and lifted my legs. Each time my swing seat passed over the pit viper waiting below me, the snake would strike the bottom of it, just missing my raised legs. I wanted to jump out of the seat, but I couldn't get my body to cooperate, and my legs were getting tired. I was unable to do anything but hold on with white knuckles. But my inertia was fading and the swing was slowing down. I finally managed to scream as I swooped down over the snake one last time and as I was coming back down, I saw my savior beneath me. But it wasn't God or Superman, it was, it was God spelled backwards. It was Osiris. He came out of nowhere, snatched the snake up without making a single sound, and shook that little bastard until it was lifeless. Then, as if just to be sure, he tore it into pieces. I still recall the sound the rattle made as my big giant dog shredded the creature that tried to attack me. Needless to say, after that, Osiris was my hero. He didn't leave my side for the rest of the day. When I told Dad what happened and showed him what was left of the snake, he simply said it was a waste of good boots. My dad worked weekdays from sunup to sundown. I never really knew what his job was, but he came home hungry, cranky, and tired every day. If dinner wasn't ready to eat and piping hot, Dad wouldn't be happy with Mom. Whenever she upset him, he'd put her in time out in their bedroom. That was never a good thing. It wasn't like a naughty step. Unless a naughty step is something you can pick up and bludgeon someone with. All I know is that when dad closed the bedroom door and put mom in time out, I wouldn't see her again until the next day. 
He turned the stereo on in the room, put it at full volume, and then do what he did to her. Osiris would sit by my side and whimper. I would hold him and we would comfort each other. But there was nothing we could do to help my mother. Her timeouts were always long-winded, and when she emerged from them, she did so with deep bruises, black eyes, and heavy scrapes or cuts all over her body. Back then, I just figured it was what happened when adults get put in time out. With the darkness that surrounded those times, it somehow felt normal. And Mom always blamed herself. Sometimes, when I did something wrong, she'd even take the blame from me. My mother didn't have a job. Her responsibility to homeschool me was more important. And she taught me everything. Reading, writing, math, all the core subjects. She was always kind and very rarely ever angry. She was the complete opposite of my father. No matter how she felt, she made sure I learned something every day. One time, the morning after one of her timeouts, I remember my mom crawling out of her room on her hands and knees. She was in intense pain. She looked broken. I don't remember why dad punished her the night before, but she got it bad that night. One of the worst. Her eyes were swollen, her face busted, and her hair was matted to the side of her head. She had scratches all over her body and a yellow crust pasted to the side of her face. She could barely see, but she still managed to teach me my school lessons while laying down on the floor that day. When I asked her why she wasn't sitting in her chair like she normally did, she told me she was just tired. I asked her if the time out hurt. She answered yes, but she said she deserved it. She'd made dad angry. And it wasn't nice to make people angry, especially my father. I found it hard to sleep in that house. Sometimes because of mom's time out, it had a habit of carrying on through the night. And I never knew what state she'd be in the next day. It worried me for sure, but what really scared me played on my young mind even more so. What terrified me the most was what I didn't know, and what kept me awake were the sounds that came from the basement. I don't know how to describe the noises that came from under my room other than to say that it sounded like the devil himself lived beneath my house. Sometimes I'd hear metal scraping or dragging sounds down there, sometimes pounding, sometimes even growling. It was always slightly muffled but loud enough to keep me awake at night. I couldn't ask questions about the basement to my dad and mom. Well, mom would just tell me that Osiris was put down there when he wouldn't behave. But I knew that wasn't true. She was just trying to calm my fear and divert my inquisitiveness. I knew damn well she was lying because one night the sounds were so loud and I couldn't sleep for so long that I ended up getting thirsty. My mouth was completely dry. So, against my father's rules, I got up in the middle of the night and quietly drifted into the kitchen for a glass of milk. The door to the basement was just on the other side of the kitchen near a dark corner of the room. I felt like it was watching me as I crept over to the cabinets to fetch a glass. Just as I was about to open the fridge, I heard scratching on the other side of the basement door. It startled me at first, but then I felt a great sense of relief. Oh, Cyrus. Of course it was. Mom was being honest with me. I walked over to the basement door and put my hand on it. The scratching stopped and I could hear a faint whimper. Poor boy, I thought. I felt bad for him. I sat down on the ground in the dark, cross-legged, facing the basement as I whispered his name. 
and reassured him through the door that he'd be allowed out in the morning. Osiris whimpered and sniffed the other side of the basement door. But a few seconds after uttering my dog's name, I heard something behind me that jolted me upright again. Tap, 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 tap. The sound came from the hardwood floor that led to the hall of the kitchen. My back was flat against the basement door and my heart was pounding upon it through my body. I watched as a large figure emerged from the dark hallway before me. It was on all fours. It was massive. It was angry. It was... It was Osiris. But if he was in the kitchen, then... I didn't have time to think. With a low growl, my dog lunged in my direction in a fury like I'd never seen. I jumped out of the way just in time, but he obviously wasn't after me. As he hit the basement door with both paws, he went absolutely berserk as he tried to get to whatever was behind the door. It was like he was possessed. He'd never done that before. Not even with the snake. He growled and howled and clawed and bit at the bottom of the door with bad intentions. But the thing on the other side seemed equally as determined to break the barrier and reach Osiris. The creature in the basement pounded the backside of the door with such force that the chains bounced and I was sure the padlock was going to snap off. I scurried across the floor and hid under the kitchen table in between the old wooden chairs. I was trembling. What if the door wouldn't hold? What if Osiris couldn't hold up against the beast in the basement? I could do nothing but watch and hide in my helplessness. Then suddenly, as if God said so, the kitchen light switched on as I watched a pair of legs rush into the room toward the basement door. Two big arms reached down and grabbed Osiris. In an instant, he disappeared with a yelp. Two seconds later, he came crashing down on the other side of the room, squealing and howling in pain. I felt horrible. I wanted to run to him, but I didn't. Instead, he limped his way over to me, under the table. Blood was coming from his mouth as he nestled into my side, whimpering in pain. He was hurt. Obviously, someone had just thrown him across the kitchen. The legs from before kicked the basement door as a voice roared two words. Shut up. It was Dad. As soon as he gave the command, neither Osiris or the basement beast made another sound. There was a small pool of my dog's blood on the floor beneath the table we were cowering under. Tears streamed down my face, but I didn't make a sound. I looked at Osiris. I'd never seen him scared. But he was. He was scared of my father. Suddenly, in a flash, he slid backwards away from me. Come here, you stupid mutt! Dad growled as he pulled Osiris from beneath the table by his tail, straddled his back in the middle of the kitchen, and began to beat him without mercy. Each time Osiris would lift his head, my dad would hit him again, over and over and over with closed fists. I I saw the whole thing, and... I thought he was going to kill him, but I could do nothing. (laughs) Nothing. Dad never knew I was under the table. And while I knew he was capable of extreme violence, up until that point, I'd only ever seen the aftermath of it. But that night I knew my father was the real monster in our house. He scared us more than the beast in the basement ever could. I stayed under the table until I was sure he was gone. About an hour after he flipped off the kitchen light and went to bed, I wiped up the blood and silently dragged my furry buddy into my room. He didn't even lift his head. Osiris survived but lost an eye and a couple teeth. He also sustained a permanent limp after that incident. I never let myself forget how much of a coward I was for not trying to protect my dog like he once did me. My father was a venomous snake, and I'd let him swing on my best friend without any resistance. I'll never live it down. The next day after Dad went to work, 
I told my mom that I knew Osiris wasn't the thing in the basement. She was washing the dishes. She stopped instantly. The glass I never poured milk into was soapy in her hands. She was still facing the sink, but she wasn't moving. It was like she had frozen in her place, like she'd seen the face of Medusa in the window in front of her. She didn't acknowledge what I said. I asked her if she heard me. She still didn't speak or move. I turned up the volume and demanded to see what was in the basement, but before I could finish my sentence, she spun around, dropping the slippery glass in her hands. It fell to the ground, shattering on her feet as she roared as loud as a dying banshee. It was like at that very moment, everything was red-tinted and time slowed down. She was trembling. Her feet were bleeding. She stared deep into my eyes, shaking uncontrollably. Then she hissed the next words at me. You never go in there! Do you hear me? Never! That place is haunted by a demon! The basement is strictly off limits! Do you understand? I nodded my head in agreement and helped my mom clean up the glass that sliced her feet. Back in the 80s, my mother was a delivery driver at Domino's. She worked a lot of late nights, and when she did, I normally spent the night at my grandmother's house until my mom's shift ended. At the time of this story, I was about two years old. If my memory serves me correct, for some reason, my mother and my grandmother weren't getting along, so I had to stay with the babysitter. My mom found her in the classified section of our local newspaper. Her name was Lynn. She was skinny and lived in a double-wide trailer out in the sticks, off a gravel county road. I stayed with Lynn one night. On the second night, before work, my mother called Lynn to make sure she was home. Surprisingly, she instructed my mom not to drop me off at her trailer. Instead, Lynn wanted to meet in another part of town on the side of a road. My mom kind of thought this was odd, but just figured that the babysitter had been out running errands and wouldn't be home for a while. My mother and Lynn parked beside each other and talked through rolled-down car windows for a while. After a few minutes, Lynn told my mom that she needed to get going. My mom agreed, realizing she would be late for work if the conversation continued any longer. Instead of getting out of the car, Lynn suggested that my mom just hand me to her via the window. I was a small kid, and the cars were parked quite close to each other, so I guess it didn't seem like a completely absurd thing to do. It wasn't normal, but it wasn't a red flag either. So my mom unbuckled me from the back seat and proceeded to pass me out the window to Lynn. I was only two, but even I remember what happened next. I screamed, I cried, and I struggled as I desperately tried to fight off Lynn's wrinkled hands. My mother almost dropped me, but it was no use. Lynn's grip was solid. She pulled me into her car and tried to buckle me in the passenger seat as I pleaded for my mommy. My mom just looked so confused as she reassured me that she'd be back soon and there was nothing to be afraid of. But I was afraid. My mom said I shivered when Lynn touched me. I remember the solid, quick, electric jolt of terror I felt. No nightmare or monster under my bed could ever compare to the heavy fear I felt that day when the babysitter put her hands on me. I know she did her best to try, but my mom could not hold back the uneasy wave of dread that was breaking through her facial expression as she told me to behave and be good for Lynn. Lynn grinned as she told my mother not to worry. She promised my mom I'd be fine and stated that she had some fun planned for us that she just knew I was going to enjoy. Then my mother and her said goodbye 
and Lynn drove away with me still sobbing out loud for my mommy. I can remember the babysitter driving really fast in her pickup truck while smoking one cigarette after another. As soon as my mom was out of sight, Lynn was different. She became angry and told me to stop making all that noise or she'd give me something to cry about. But I didn't stop. I couldn't. She roared at me like a psychopath, screaming at the top of her lungs for me to just shut up several times. But that just made me cry harder. Suddenly Lynn violently slammed on the brakes and pulled the truck over to the side of the road. Then she put her head in her arms and screamed as loud as she could. It was the scream of a dying animal. Inhuman. Lynn moaned oddly and was breathing as if she was hyperventilating. This went on for several seconds before she finally stopped everything. Her limp body slumped forward against the steering wheel of the truck engaging the horn. It blared continuously, but there was no one around to help. And I don't remember how I reacted. I just remember that after about a minute, Lynn quickly shot back up and slowly turned her head to face me. Her eyes were rolled to the back of her head and her facial expression was blank. She stayed like that for what felt like forever. Then she burst into a fit of uncontrollable laughter as she put the truck in drive and sped down the road still giggling for as far as I can remember. That's where it fades out in my thoughts. That's all the memory I have of Lynn, the babysitter. My mom couldn't stop thinking about how I reacted when she handed me over to Lynn. I'd never acted like that with anyone. I mean, I had a problem with strangers, but my problem was that I was too trusting of people I didn't know. So the way I responded to Lynn was totally out of character for me. I was afraid of her as though she was the boogeyman, and my mom couldn't get my horrified face out of her head. It was a slow night for pizza delivery, so my mom had a word with her boss and explained the situation to her. She told my mom to take the night off and go and get me if she felt that I may be in danger. She also said that she knew just how strong a mother's intuition can be as she had three boys herself. So my mom took the advice, clocked out, and drove out to Lynn's house to pick me up. When she got to Lynn's trailer, she knocked on the door. Lynn answered it with the chain still attached and she was out of it. Her eyes were bloodshot and her face was red. My mom also noticed a white crust around Lynn's mouth that looked like dried drool. She bluntly asked my mom what she wanted. My mom replied that she was there to pick me up. Lynn wasn't happy about this. She told my mom she was too early and that I wasn't ready to leave yet so she'd have to come back. And that's when my mother began to get a little angry. She sternly told Lynn she didn't care if I was ready to go and to unlock the door so she could see her son. Lynn glared at my mom and said, well you can't have him yet. And that's when my mom says she lost it and rammed open the door, causing Lynn to go flying across the room onto the floor. My mom looked her right in the eye and said, Bitch, if I want my son, you don't tell me no or I'll beat you to death on your own floor. Lynn was terrified. My mom looked around the room. The trailer was horrendously messy. And laying passed out in the living room of Lynn's double wide were three dirty looking rough men. There were used blood-stained needles on the coffee table. One of the ugly men still had his belt tied around his arm. All three guys were out cold and completely oblivious to what just happened. Where is he? My mom demanded, staring unblinkingly at a cowering Lynn. Lynn pointed her trembling finger down the hall. My mom ran as fast as she could to the door at the end of the trailer and flung it open. I was sleeping on a bare mattress on the floor with no diaper or underwear on. I didn't even have a blanket or pillow on the bed. I was only wearing a shirt. My mom scooped me up into her arms and quickly rushed out of the room. As she moved back down the hall, she saw Lynn in the bathroom kneeling in front of the toilet, 
throwing up. She momentarily locked eyes with my mom for a second and said, Please, I need that money. Before burying her head back into the toilet to puke some more. My mom said as she passed by the unconscious men in the living room, one of them started foaming at the mouth while violently convulsing until he slid off the dirty sofa and onto the dirty carpet floor. But she didn't stop. He was Lynn's problem and it was obvious that she had a full list of problems. My mother took me home and I don't think anyone other than close family members ever babysat me again. About seven months later, my mom read a story in the paper about a woman who overdosed on heroin in her trailer. Her body hadn't been found for weeks. Her red and white truck was still in the driveway. After days of knocking and receiving no answer, friends of hers reported an unusual amount of flies buzzing in the windows of her trailer, coupled with a horrible stench leaking out from behind the front door. So the cops came and kicked it in, and sure enough, it was Lynn, lying in the middle of her living room, dead and badly decomposed. A needle was still sticking out of her arm. A big investigation revealed that another one of Lynn's problems was trafficking young children to men for money or drugs. They found Lynn's black book, some letters, pictures, a price list, and some other evidence in her possession. Turns out she was a part of a bigger ring that acquired children via classified ads and unsuspecting parents. The parents paid her, and she got paid to pimp out their children. But Lynn wasn't alone. There were several women involved at the bottom of the ring that served as pimps. Different women, different locations, but the same had men at the top. They were an organization. They called themselves the Babysitter's Club, and the whole group seemingly disappeared off the face of the earth right around the time Lynn OD'd. Now, I already told you everything I remember about Lynn, and I'm not going to tell you about the man I see in my flashbacks, the guy who rented me. You don't want those details running loose in your mind, trust me. You get the moral of the story without them. Do not trust strangers with your children and always pay attention to your intuition. I've dealt with the demons that this experience created and I try not to let them haunt me. But I can't help but wonder if the babysitter's club is still at large. And as for the customer that did what he did to me, if by chance you're listening to this right now, Let's meet. I dare you. I've got some fun planned for you that I just know you're gonna enjoy. This is truly the scariest, most horrible thing that has ever happened to me. I've never been so petrified in my life. To this day, I still don't know who this man was, what he was trying to do, or if he still is where I saw him. I was back home for the summer for the first time in a year after starting uni. Our home was, still is, just outside of a small town with forests all around. There was also a small man-made lake which was diverged from a river that ran for miles through the forest and ramified into a few streams east of the lake. Near my home, there was a small grassy path that led to the river following a stream. It was a long walk, but one I used to go on often as a child. I knew the forest there well. I knew where I could cut through dense trees to meet the stream. The walk I would go on always led off the path which turned northwest slowly, so away from the stream and then took a sharp turn to the west after a few miles walk, at which point the stream was hidden quite deep into the forest. I'd continue to walk north and follow the stream through the forest to get to the river, and then follow the river west to get to the lake. It's easy to get lost in this forest because the terrain isn't just a slope down to the water. It goes up and down and you end up completely surrounded by trees. I'd spend many days wandering around there alone or with my dad over the span of 18 years. Never saw anybody else in the forest. I went there twice that summer, both times alone. 
The first time I left in the morning, I walked along the path, away from the stream to the sharp bend, then cut back into the forest. I reached the stream after an hour or so. As I was running my hands in the water, I heard a bell from far away, coming from the north. Something was making a bell ringing, fervently and periodically, which I found strange. I listened, wondered if it was a lost hunting dog, and started moving towards the sound. I bloody know I'd be the first person to die, but I was heading north anyway, so whatever. I realized it couldn't have been an animal. I could tell the bell was too heavy because of how clear the sound was to be on a collar. I kept moving and the bell was moving away from me. It stopped completely after five minutes. The stream wasn't big enough or strong enough to carry a bell. That could have been enclosed in a tin or something and the river was too far still. I thought of everything, but nothing explained the sound, apart from one obvious thing, which I just didn't feel comfortable with for some reason. I knew it had to be a person. I stopped thinking about it and just walked on normally, until I found a badger, a bloomin' dead one, carefully decapitated. It had obviously been done with a knife, it was fairly fresh, the body was still limp and there wasn't too much smell coming from it. The wound was full of maggots, but I knew that happened soon after exposure. The sound of the bell had been following the stream, so had I. So the badger was put there, maybe killed there, or at least decapitated, while it was walking that way. I suppose, I really didn't know. And nothing else happened that day. One week later, I went back for the second time that summer, and the last time ever. I left home at around 6 p.m., I made it to the stream, then walked to the river in an hour, and then decided to go back the way I came because it was getting late and it was raining quite heavily. The sun set at around 9pm. I was walking as fast as I could. The sound of the rain and the leaves was surreal and loud. I was somewhat trotting with my head down for a while through the clearest and most open part of the forest when I bumped into something heavy. The smell was sickly. It was the decomposing body of the badger with his head strung to his front paws. That area looked a bit like ham because of the way it was tied, just swinging from a tree, like an almost literal load of bollocks. It was this putrid bag of stench, wet and dripping green liquid. I started gagging. I had some sort of mucus textured fluid in my hair. It was repulsive. At first, I just stared at it slightly gobsmacked, then I started fidgeting violently because I felt like I was drenched in its juices. I was soaked from the rain. My senses became confused. It felt like a bucket of ice-cold water had been thrown over me when I realized that I walked the same way to get to the river, so someone had strung the body up after I'd passed it on the way there. Someone knew I'd see it. So, was someone watching me and running around the forest? with the faint sounds of branches breaking around me, not animals. I looked around and started jogging. I was half running, half walking away from the stream back towards the path for a while when I heard the bell again. I proceeded to call my dad while running. I told him to meet me on the path where it sharply turns west. It was the closest part of the path to me to go as fast as he could and that someone was in the forest. I can't explain the feeling I had, it was like I just completely let out my intestines and stomach. I literally felt the hairs on my neck raised despite being soaked. It was dark. I jogged as fast as I could. I was panicking because the path was still a bit far away, just too far to feel safe. It was still raining. Every single sound was muffled. I felt like everything was further away than ever before. The bell went on for way longer than the last time, on and off. I felt like it was surrounding me at one point. The fear combined with my compromised hearing and the fact that I couldn't flip and breathe properly was making me slightly lose my sense of direction. I was automatically heading southwest, but I wasn't really sure what I was even doing. I was breathing like a freaking horse, coughing my lungs up, kind of crying out loud like a toddler does, tripping over leaves and twigs like an idiot. I stayed on the phone with my mom, who was on her way with my dad. I kept hearing sounds, but I wasn't sure what they were. My mom was screaming on the phone at the same time that they were on the path, that I needed to run, 
that my dad had gotten out and was heading east from the path bend. I was terrified, so I went into survival mode. I was doing the half-running, half-speed walking thing again because I was out of breath. Then I heard branches break, clear footsteps for the first time from down in the forest, and the bell ringing louder. I didn't want to, but I looked over my shoulder. And that's when I saw what was in the forest with me. A tall figure creeping in my direction at the very end of the clearing, ringing this bell slowly in front of his stomach. I could tell he was staring straight at me. Now I don't know if I had a hidden secret sprinting ability or instinctual adrenaline induced superhuman powers, but when I tell you I ran for my life, I didn't look back once. I screamed as much as I could. I lied. I'm on the phone with the police. They're on the path. Dad, I can see you. I'm here. I was yelling. I wanted to yell, Dad, please, where are you? But I kept that to myself. I felt like something awful was going to happen. I felt like the man was right behind me. I kept telling myself not to look. I was gasping and wheezing, crying so hard and screaming for my dad. I felt shivers on my neck and then switched off. I just ran. I even dropped my bag and only realized I didn't have it anymore when I was in the car. I felt like my phone was my only way home. Things no longer felt real. It was like my legs were moving by themselves. I didn't know if the man was still following me. I could only hear my heart beating in my ears and the bell. I finally heard my dad shout my name and I knew he was coming my way and that he could see me because of the intonation of his voice. I pretty much lunged at him when we got to each other. My dad heard the bell too. My mom could hear it over the phone. She was waiting with the car ready to leave fast. We went directly to the police station and I got medical attention soon after. My dad burst into tears in the car, said he could hear the bell and thought he wouldn't be able to see me. Asked what if I didn't have my phone? What if he hadn't picked up? They were almost as terrified as me because they witnessed everything through the call. They could hear me trying to run, and they could hear the danger. They just couldn't see it. The police couldn't really do much. They searched the area, and the only thing they found was a folded t-shirt placed under a rock. I didn't really question that at the time, and my bag was not recovered. They said it was probably some homeless man living in the forest, but failed to realize what could have happened if my dad didn't know that part of the forest like I did and where to find me. I'm not blaming anyone. The entire thing was my fault, there was just so many what ifs. I want to believe it was just someone who decided to live in the woods and hunt or something. Maybe they were a bit mentally unstable and they felt angry that I came into their territory, but what if it was more insidious? The way he moved towards me was abnormal. It was perverse because of how slowly he was ringing the bell. It was like he had me trapped. I didn't see any more details, I just ran. To this day, I can't bloody go anywhere where I'll be alone, and the sound of bells are a real problem, as well as the smell of moss. I never thought that I'd have anything to post on this subreddit, but here I go. This literally just happened, so I'll try to keep this as short and as organized as possible. I'm a 29-year-old female, and my partner is a 23-year-old female. We are back in her hometown visiting her family for about a week. It's a very small, isolated town in the middle of nowhere and basically in the middle of the woods. While we were here, she wanted to meet up with an old high school friend who still lives in the area. We'll call him Kyle. So we meet Kyle at the beach and right away he's acting super weird, making jokes about a three-way with us and just making a bunch of just unwelcome, gross comments. Obviously, we're unfortunately used to this stuff to a certain extent, but coming from someone who was supposed to be her good friend, it was extra annoying. So, my girlfriend and I are shooting each other panic looks the whole time. Once he's out of earshot for a second, she says that she's sorry, that he's never been like this before, and we can make an excuse to leave. When he comes back, we tell him we want to get dinner at a local bar, but he just asks to join us. We felt awkward, so we end up saying yes. He says he doesn't know quite how to get there, so he follows us. We get there, order drinks and food, then head out to their patio with the drinks. He makes a few more gross comments, but is generally being way more cool and normal than he was at the beach. 
We're smoking some weed on the patio and chilling. The food comes quick and we finish it quicker. Now, here's where it gets really messed up. So halfway through my first drink, I'm feeling really tired, which makes sense as we've had a long day. I give my girlfriend the signal that I want to go. She makes an excuse that we need to go. And he keeps trying to get us to come to his house. I've got some good weed and dabs there and you can meet my cats. Blah, blah, blah. He's being really pushy. We keep saying no and making excuses. We need to check on our grandpa, etc. So finally we get in the car and say goodnight. We park next to each other and walk up and into the cars together while saying our goodbyes. When we get into the car, my girlfriend informs me that she wants to stay at the bar, but fake it like we're leaving because she doesn't want to chill with him anymore, understandably. So we're sitting in the car waiting for him to leave first when he signals for us to roll down the window. We do, he says, GPS is being kind of funny, and can we lead him to the main road? To be fair, we're in the middle of nowhere, so this didn't seem too outlandish. So obviously staying behind at the bar was out of the question. So, in the car, we were talking about how pushy was being, and she admitted she feels weird driving right back to her grandpa's house, so we should drive into town until we lose him. He's behind us for a long time, even way after he should have gotten off on his exit. We think it's weird, but we weren't sure what to do. So finally we get on a two-lane road and he pulls up next to us and he's waving a phone, which is clearly my girlfriend's phone, in the window. We pull over. He gives her the phone back, chats just a few seconds, then leaves in a hurry. Here's the part that makes my skin crawl. We know we had her phone. I saw her put it in her fanny pack, which was on the table, along with my phone and her bud. A few minutes before we left the bar, as we were preparing to leave, she didn't take it back out. There was literally no way she could have left it at the bar. More importantly, he got in his car and left the bar at the same time as us, meaning he had to have already had the phone when we were leaving. It's not like we left the bar first and he saw it left on the table or something. He literally had to have been walking to the cars with us and calmly said goodnight with the phone already in his possession. Now the kicker, apparently unbeknownst to me, my girlfriend had tasted a very weird bitter taste in her straw at the bar and was already suspicious, especially with how he's been acting. This is why she wanted to stay back at the bar, to get away from him and stay in public where she felt it was safer. So when he walked up to the car to return her cell phone, she very casually and deliberately flashed the knife that she kept for protection in her jacket. I didn't know at the time that she had done this, so that's why he had left so quickly. Obviously, I was annoyed with her for not telling me her suspicions sooner, but she just didn't want me to panic. I'm really shaken up. A few things are clear. One, he stole my girlfriend's phone, and it seems like he did so so that we would be forced to pull over on a dark road in the middle of nowhere. Two, he quickly ended the conversation and left when my girlfriend flashed her knife. They've been good friends for almost ten years. If he wasn't planning on doing something malicious, I feel like he would have acted confused about the knife or said something like, What's up, why would you flash a knife at me? Is this some sort of bad movie or something? But instead he just booked it, which tells me he knew exactly what she was doing, reacting to a threat and preparing to protect herself and me. And three, he probably spiked our drinks. My girlfriend noticed a weird taste in her straw right away and chose not to finish her drink. I finished half my drink and I felt relatively tired. A few more things, I just don't know how he managed to nab the phone without us noticing or knowing. It doesn't really make any sense, but he did. Me and my girlfriend both remember her putting it in her fanny pack perfectly. We also had no idea how he could have spiked our drinks unless he was working with the bartender but we were the ones who suggested that bar. I don't know exactly how he did it, but I think I know why. And for that reason, my girlfriend's now ex-friend who made creepy comments, probably tried to drug us, and stole her phone in order to get us alone on a dark road. Please, keep your distance. Dear Mr. X, It's me again, Tammy. Not long ago, I sent you a story about a haunting... I can't tell you how good it felt to be able to share my experience with people who wouldn't make me feel like an idiot or a liar. Well, 
I have another story I hope you'll find interesting. These events happened several years after I was haunted by May, the woman in the yellow dress. I may have mentioned this before, but both my parents had a long commute to work. My dad was in the army and managed to get my mom a position at the munitions depot near the post he was stationed at in Nevada. Eventually, they decided to find a sitter for my little brother and I that was much closer to the base. We were the youngest after all, so my parents wanted us not to be so far out of reach. We even went to school in the local area there, thus avoiding the nearly non-existent education system in the small town where we lived. Our babysitter's name was Terry. She had a nice house, but it definitely stood out in her quaint little neighborhood. It was the only real house on the block, and it was obviously very old, built in a sort of colonial style that was popular so many decades ago. Most of the other townsfolk lived in either single or double wide trailer homes. Even more unusual, Terry's house was painted bubblegum pink. Being no stranger to the paranormal, even at nine years old, my sensitivity had grown since my last encounter. I began seeing shadows of people and hearing voices echoing down empty halls. My mother would instruct me to carry a blessed handkerchief and sing church songs out loud whenever I felt scared or threatened. When we first started being dropped off at Terry's house, everything was normal. We would go to school, do our homework, eat snacks, play outside, kid stuff. My mom would pick us up in the afternoons. After a while though, I started noticing little anomalies happening every now and then. Small things like glasses of juice tipping over, chairs moving on their own, disembodied footsteps and thumping on hallway walls. My brother and I would sometimes even hear a woman crying. The first major event happened during Christmas time. I was given the role of the Virgin Mary in a nativity play for our church. I would also be singing. One morning, I was sitting in the kitchen with Terry and my brother, getting ready to practice one of my songs. It's important to know that this kitchen had a tiled ceiling. The moment I tried to start singing, the windows began to shake violently, briefly shocking me into silence. After a moment or two, I decided to continue since windows were known to shake a bit during windstorms that were common at that time of the year. When I opened my mouth to sing again, suddenly the ceiling tiles all fell down on us at once. Simultaneously, I heard a loud scream. I wasn't sure if it was Terry or my own voice. As the screaming faded away in my ears, I could hear my brother crying. We all sat there in a state of bewilderment for what seemed like minutes before Terry got up and led us out of the kitchen, carefully navigating the floor which was covered in ceramic shards. As soon as we crossed into the next room, I heard a sound that I couldn't describe if I tried. I turned around and saw all the tiles floating back up, replacing themselves exactly as they'd been before they fell. It was like the terrifying event had never even happened. After this, the little things kept on as usual with one exception. The woman's cries began to sound more and more clear, whereas before, it just sounded like muffled sobbing. I was able to gradually make out words. It was like she was begging someone. No, no. Please. Please. Stop. Stop. I'm sorry. sorry. As time went on, we began to see the woman appearing in the house. The strange thing is that her presence was not in the least bit frightening. Whenever a glass would fall or a window would shake, she would be there standing over us. She radiated this warm, comforting energy. She had shoulder-length blonde hair. She was skinny with green eyes, appearing to be in her thirties. The sad thing was that sometimes she would appear to be beaten up. Her eyes swollen shut, lips split wide open, the side of her head sunken in and slumped over to one side. When she appeared to us, sometimes we would also see a man. He was an imposing figure, perhaps in his late thirties or early forties. He had pale white skin, with light brown hair and dark eyes filled with rage. His face seemed permanently trapped in a scowl, and the purest kind of malice emanated from him whenever he was there. 
I got the sense that he would have no qualms with hurting or even killing my brother and I if he had the chance, though I didn't know why. The weather in our part of the state was extreme at times. Bad storms were known to crop up out of nowhere and were often extremely dangerous. One day while I was at school, a storm hit that had the whole region scrambling to evacuate. The evacuation window was so narrow that I missed my bus due to my being in the bathroom when the announcement was made. My parents decided to have me stay with Terry until my dad could get away from his duties, preparing the military base to weather the storm. My little brother was already with my mom, and they were on their way home, so I would be going to Terry's house alone for the first time. That made me a bit anxious because I had a bad feeling. The storm raged on until nighttime as I waited for my dad to come pick me up. At some point, I snuggled into the couch to relax. Terry was in another room. Now, this is the part where things got a bit fuzzy. I'm not sure whether the following took place in my dreams, or if I was in some kind of trance. All I know is that I don't remember falling asleep. This all just started happening. In the house around me, I began to see visions of a man and woman looking very happy. I could see that it was the same couple that appeared to us in the house. I'd never seen them looking so pleasant and full of life. The bright, loving pair carried boxes and furniture, setting them throughout the house as they seemed to enjoy a silent conversation between themselves. I couldn't hear or make out what they were saying. Before long though, things took a turn toward a dark path that my childlike mind was not exactly prepared for. I began to see the man drinking from glass bottles and hitting the woman repeatedly. Time appeared to move on at an accelerated rate as the hitting and drinking continued over and over again. The woman stayed and stayed through it all. Even though she was clearly suffering, her injuries multiplied. I began to notice something odd. When the man moved, a liquid-like substance flew from his body, splattering and soaking into the walls like blood. It was as if the anger and hatred of his actions were taking a physical form and infusing into the very structure of the home whenever he raised his hand to strike his wife. At one point, he began beating her more fiercely than ever. Again, she begged him to stop. He didn't, or couldn't stop until she had died. Her waif-like frame crumpled to the ground in front of me. Realizing what he had done, the man wept over her for a moment, but somehow his sadness transformed back into anger and he began kicking and stomping her skinny, broken body. For what felt like several more days, he continued to drink and wander around the house. The concentrated wrath oozed and dripped from his body, seeping into the floorboards and every surface he came into contact with. Eventually, he picked up her body and carried her into the master bedroom. He laid her on the bed before lying down next to her, and then he shot himself in the head. That gunshot was the first noise I had heard since the vision began. It snapped me out of it instantly. As I awoke, my dad was carrying me out to his car. My mind was preoccupied with this feeling that the man wanted to trap his wife, that he would do anything to make sure he wouldn't lose her. To tell you the truth, I didn't even completely comprehend what I had seen at the time. It's just my clear memory of the vision that makes me able to process it now with my adult mind. Weeks went by before I told my mom what had happened, what I had seen that day. After the incident with the lady in the yellow dress, she had no problem believing me. She got us a new sitter not long after that. I never went back to the pink house, nor have I seen Terry since that time. She always used to say that nothing strange happened in the house except when my brother and I were there. Anyway, thanks again for listening as always, Mr. X. Sincerely, Tammy. Greetings, friends. This came from a conversation I had which quickly turned into a bit of a live interview with a friend of mine. He used to live in my neighborhood until very recently. His name was Gabriel. One evening, Gabriel and I were talking when the topic of discussion meandered into the territory of the strange, a thing that's quite common when I talk to people as I'm sure you would probably guess. As the key words began to pop up, 
Ghosts, vampires, dogmen, glitches, etc. I noticed a peculiar spark of familiarity, of passion in his eyes that told me without a doubt he himself had seen something or another in his time. Gabriel was a native of Costa Rica. He grew up most of his life there before immigrating to the United States. When I asked him if he had ever seen anything odd, his eyes widened. Yes, I did, he said, half excited, half under his breath. Have you ever heard of Cadejos? I had not. As he spoke, I ran an image search of the Spanish word. Gabriel's eyes shifted, almost looking past me as he recounted the story of a dark night in San Jose, Costa Rica, when he was only ten years old. He lived with his mother, father and older brother, Miguel, in a small suburb called Las Animas, meaning City of Lost Souls. The family home was a brand new construction on a street with only two houses that were separated by several empty lots. Gabriel's father was a metal worker, so he made sure his home was fortified with steel doors, door frames, and window bars to withstand the high crime rate of the small town. The small backyard was walled in to make it less attractive to robbers, and they had a Doberman guard dog named Rambo to keep watch when the family was out. The dog had to be trained to only accept food from Gabriel's father, because thieves in the area were known to try to feed poison to guard dogs. In that neighborhood, there was typically an unspoken curfew for children after dark. If they were away from home and not with their parents, or didn't have a ride home, they were basically to stay the night wherever they were, just to be safe. So one night, Gabriel and his brother Miguel were over at their friend Carlos's house, who happened to live in the only other house on their street. They ended up staying until just after nightfall, but they really wanted to go home anyway. The two brothers debated with Carlos and his mother about walking home, Although both houses were extremely well lit with floodlights, there was about 75 yards of unlit dirt road and knee-high grass between them. Now, they had made the trek into darkness before, but always with their mother waiting outside keeping an eye on them. This time she was nowhere to be seen, making the boys feel a bit more apprehensive. As their debate continued, their mother finally stepped out and began to wave at them to come home. When they saw her, the boys started on their way at a jog, turning back to say goodnight to Carlos and his mother as they went back inside. But that is where things got weird. When the boys turned back to look at their mother, she was gone. What they saw instead, standing across the street in the middle of a field, a ways up the road toward them, was a dog. The boys slowed down to a walk as their old tennis shoes scraped across the unpaved, overgrown road. They stared at the dark figure in the distance, trying to decipher it. They could tell it was a dog. No surprise. They had one, but it looked far too large and imposing to be their Doberman. They noticed the glimmer of a thick chain wrapped around the dog's neck. The eerie sound of the metal rattling permeated the night air. For a moment, they told themselves it was just Rambo. Maybe he broke free of his chain and got out. The brothers argued over whether or not it was their own dog as they walked steadily toward the house. The closer they got to where the mysterious dog was, the more they noticed that it seemed to be growing in size. When they finally realized that what they were looking at was not their beloved Rambo, the two young boys halted in their tracks. Gabriel looked up at Miguel. As we sat in my studio, Gabriel's eyes began to well with tears. He said that despite all the trouble they'd gotten into, that moment was the first time he'd ever seen his big brother scared. They didn't know it at the time, but what they were seeing, the thing that was watching them, was a cadejo, what you and I might call a hellhound. The black dog shifted its ominous gaze between the boys and their house, looking back and forth over and over, as if acknowledging that at any moment they were going to have to make a run for it. It stood as an imposing wall between them and safe haven. The boys knew that they were too far to make it back to Carlos's house without being caught, but that continuing down the road felt like certain death. Their best chance was to walk back the way they came. They slowly turned and started back when they heard their front door open. 
Their mother emerged from the doorway with her hand shielding her eyes from the floodlights. Throwing their fears to the wind, the brothers made the only decision they could. They broke into a sprint, running harder than they ever had before to save their mother. The hound's head shot toward her as it catapulted its massive body into the air, leaping at least 30 feet in one terrifying motion before violently slamming into the ground and beginning its own mad dash toward the house. The beast cut a wide path through the tall weeds of the field. The loud metallic sounding of the chains intensified as it closed in. Somehow, the boys were able to get to their mother before the hound, grab hold of her and pull her inside. They slammed the door behind them. Their mother stood against the wall in a state of disbelief, praying as the front door trembled with blow after blow from the enraged monster outside. After only a few moments of excruciating terror, the noise suddenly stopped, replaced by a loud car horn blaring from outside the garage. Gabriel's father yelled at them to activate the metal-clad garage door. Miguel hit the switch to open it, and was promptly scolded by his father for letting the dog outside. Gabriel and Miguel opened the front door and looked around, finding no signs of El Cadejo. As they continued to investigate, they found poor Rambo, cowering in fear, hiding in a small crawl space underneath the stoop of their porch. As I wrapped my head around this intriguing story, jotting down notes on my computer as quickly as I could, Gabriel's face lit up at my clear fascination with the experience. He told me, you know what, using my real name. I have another story for you. Have you ever heard of La Llorona? I told him I did. A few years after the hound incident, Gabriel and Miguel were walking home late one night after a few games of basketball. There was a rough court just about a quarter mile away from their house where kids used to gather. Yet again, the boys had made the mistake of staying out after dark, so they were walking home with a bit more motivation than usual. Like most areas in their town, there were no street lights. The only illumination they had in the area came from a nearby hospital. Their journey took them past a small bridge over a creek. It was out of their way, so they usually just walked right past it. But on this night, they heard something odd coming from that direction. The sorrowful wails of a woman emanated from the dark area near the side of the bridge. Miguel insisted that they go and see what was going on. But Gabriel had a stomach-turning feeling that something was wrong and he refused to follow his brother. Miguel began to meander toward the bridge while teasing his little brother about being scared. So eventually, Gabriel half-heartedly relented and veered slightly in the direction of the bridge as well. The pitiful scream still rang out, causing Miguel's playful demeanor to shift, thinking that there may actually be someone there who needed help. He picked up speed and ran up to the guardrail, looking around for a girl who was perhaps in danger. As Miguel leaned over to investigate, all Gabriel saw was his brother's body tense up with shock, almost falling backward before darting away and down the dark street. Not needing any more convincing, Gabriel followed suit, and the brothers made the last ten blocks home in record time. Later, Gabriel asked his brother what he saw. He said there was a woman in the water, just below the bridge. She reached up to him with long arms, saying, Ben Aki, Ben Aki, come here. Gabriel told me that the entity they encountered was called La Llorona, a famous legendary figure in Hispanic culture with many variations, the most common being that she's the apparition of a woman who lost her children in a river and now haunts waterways, bringing misfortune or even death to anybody who sees or hears her. Some accounts even claim that she drowned her own children in a river, and then herself. Either way, a sad story indeed. I'm Mr. X, and may your nights be full of dreams. I'm not much of a storyteller, so bear with me. During the 90s, I went through a very rough time in my life. After a failed marriage, I became a bit of a nomad, wandering across country on foot with no particular destination. It was a stupid idea, but I was in a very hopeless place back then, and just looking to experience something new. 
I had been traveling down South Dakota and hitched a ride with a truck driver into Nebraska. For those of you who have never been to that state, there are large sections of land that go on for miles with nothing but cornfields lining either side of the road. We split ways at a rest stop, and I made my way into what I now know to be the Sand Hills of Nebraska. The Sand Hills region is one of the most isolated areas in the United States, 20,000 square miles of nothing but dunes and prairies. I planned on hitchhiking my way to the nearest town and catching a bus to visit a friend I had in Omaha. Full disclosure, I had absolutely no idea what the hell I was doing. I subscribed to the I'll figure it out when I get there mentality. At the time, I didn't know a whole lot about Nebraska, but I found out the hard way that this stretch of road was not ideal for hitchhiking. I barely saw any cars going down this road, and the ones that did completely ignored me. Twelve hours had passed, and I was running low on food and water. I was utterly exhausted at this point, and I needed to find a place to rest for a while. I had about an hour left of daylight. Lucky for me, I happened to come upon an old farmhouse that was situated about a half mile away from the main road. From a distance, I thought this place may have been occupied, but when I got closer, it was clear to me that this house was abandoned. This was around the fall, so weather in Nebraska wasn't terrible, however the nights were a bit on the cold side, so I decided to hold up in this house for the night and continue my journey the next day. I had enough supplies to last me one more night. The house was your typical rotting husk. Smelled like mold, severe water damage, creaking floors, etc. The living room seemed to be the only decent place to settle down at, so I unpacked my sleeping bag and eventually dozed off. I woke up to the sound of floorboards creaking. I immediately sat up and listened. I could hear several pairs of footsteps thudding all around the house. They were coming from upstairs, downstairs, on the back porch outside, and even in the same room with me. But I didn't see a thing. I quickly got to my feet and walked over to the nearest window and peered out. What I saw was truly alarming and sent a wave of nausea through my entire body. Several cloaked figures were standing side by side. They appeared to be encircling the house. Because of the footsteps I heard, I thought there may have been people in the house with me. So in an effort to defuse things, I made another big brain decision and spoke up. Um, hello? I'm sorry if I'm trespassing. I was just looking for a place to rest for the night. I thought this place was abandoned. Again, I'm sorry. All the footsteps stopped at once. An eerie silence followed. It was so quiet that I could have heard a mouse shitting in the corner. I got this real bad feeling in my gut, so I reached into my backpack and pulled out my hunting knife. I gathered the rest of my things and slowly moved out into the hallway. Aside from the mysterious figures outside, I was also thinking of what was making those footsteps inside the house. As I said, I heard several footsteps when I woke up, so I figured it wouldn't be long before I ran into someone inside the house. But after combing the entire downstairs, I didn't see or hear anything. I could tell something was very off. That bad feeling I mentioned earlier intensified despite the fact that I knew there was a bunch of weirdos and cloaks waiting for me outside, something told me that if I didn't leave the house that very moment, something terrible was going to happen to me. The house was located in a wide open clearing. Beyond the clearing was a barrier of tall grass. When I left through the front door, I stopped directly in front of the house. No matter which direction I looked, I saw another hooded menace blocking my way. I suddenly felt this heat on my back. I quickly turned around and was shocked to see that the house I just left was now engulfed in flames. I cannot explain how this happened. Moments before, I was inside that house, walking around, and it was now on fire. I backed away. 
I decided I was going to run through the figures and get the hell out of Dodge. But when I turned back around, the figures were nowhere in sight. Things were getting way too bizarre for me at that point. The only thing I knew for sure was that I had to get the fuck out of that place. When I got back out to the main road, I didn't stop walking until I finally got to a town, whose name I can't remember. The rest of my time in Nebraska went well, and I got my life together shortly after I got back home from my trip. As long as I live, I'll never forget that old farmhouse and those mysterious cloaked figures. This incident still baffles me to this day, but perhaps some things are best left unanswered. I'm in my late 60s, and I grew up in the Bronx. The Bronx isn't exactly known for supernatural activity, but I can tell you from living there for many years, a lot of strange things happen in New York, aside from the drug abuse and the crime that takes place in the back alleys. Let's go back in time to 1962. It was my seventh birthday. My grandmother got me this vintage Mattel Jack in the Box. This was back when these kinds of toys were more commonplace. From the moment I opened the gift, I immediately got a bad feeling. Jack in the Boxes are naturally creepy to some people, and I was never a fan of them, even as a kid. But I loved it when my grandmother came up from Brooklyn to visit us. And if I even hinted that I didn't like the toy she got me, my mother would have made sure I didn't sit down for a week. I don't know where my grandmother got this thing, but if I had to guess, she probably got it from one of the several pawn shops in the area. I think this is significant to point out, because this means that the toy was not bought brand new and had a previous owner. After my birthday celebration was over, me and my dad put all of my presents in my room. I specifically remember setting the jack-in-the-box down in my toy chest. My family had this tradition where we would always gather in the living room and listen to some radio shows before going to bed. When 8 o'clock rolled around, I was told to brush my teeth and go to bed. When I was done in the washroom and went into my bedroom to turn in, I instantly noticed that the jack-in-the-box was now resting at the foot of my bed. I was confused because I remembered putting it away in my toy chest, but I figured that one of my parents might have been messing with me, so I placed the toy under my bed and tucked myself in. I ended up having these violent, horrifying nightmares over the next following weeks. I remembered seeing unspeakable things in my dreams. Everything is obscure to me now from the passing of time and my mind trying to block out certain things but I'm confident that what I saw in my dreams was of a sexual nature. I would wake up screaming many times to the point where my mother ended up taking me to the doctors to find out what was wrong. The doctors performed several tests on me and concluded that I was perfectly healthy and recommended that I be taken to a child psychologist. The night that I got back from the doctors was when this whole situation would reach its climax and conclusion. Maybe it's obvious to everyone listening to this what was going on, but at the time, I didn't really have a clue. I woke up that night, not from a nightmare, but from that feeling you get when someone is watching you. I had a nightlight plugged in next to my bed. In the dim light, I saw the jack-in-the-box my grandmother had gotten for me resting at the foot of my bed. That's when the unthinkable happened. It was like a scene straight out of a horror film. The crank on the side of the box slowly began to turn, and a distorted, slowed-down version of the melody began to play. When the tune finished, the clown inside the box popped out. Even though I saw it coming, it still made me jump. However, there was something else that I noticed that instantly made me forget all about the creepy little plastic clown. Recalling this now still makes my insides crawl. Looming just behind the toy box was a tall black figure. The only thing I could tell you about this shadowy presence is that it had these long horns on top of its head. I was raised Catholic, but I was never told at that point in my life about the fallen angel Lucifer 
or his foot soldiers, commonly referred to as demons. My fragile little mind could not comprehend what I was witnessing, but I remembered my teachings about God's love and the power of prayer. So I closed my eyes and began to pray aloud. Shortly after I began my prayer, I heard a loud shrieking as if I was inflicting pain to whatever was in my room. As soon as I opened my eyes, I saw that the figure was gone, and the box that was still resting at the foot of my bed was now closed. We lived on the third floor of an apartment building. Outside of my room was one of those stereotypical dark alleys New York City is known for. I opened up my bedroom window and hurled the box out. As soon as I threw it, I was expecting to hear it crash on the concrete below, but instead, I heard what can only be described as giant wings flapping. I didn't see anything, but I felt a gust of cold air hit me, and I quickly shut my window and ran back under the covers. I'm sharing my story to inform everyone that there are dark forces out there beyond our comprehension. You'll be surprised to hear that I'm no longer a part of any organized religion. I'm still a very spiritual person, and I do believe in a higher power. If you're confused by this, I'll try to break this down for you in the simplest of terms. Dark entities, like the one I encountered so many years ago, are comprised of energy, and they react to other energies in different ways. If you show fear in the face of adversary, they will feed off that fear and become stronger. If you show bravery and perform an act like prayer as a means to combat the presence, that is what ultimately drives them out. I believe wholeheartedly that you don't have to belong to a church or a certain religion to deal with an intruding presence. It was this event that inspired me to become both a counselor and a paranormal investigator. I have used my experiences with the paranormal to help many families across America. So if you ever encounter one of these dark spirits in your home, remember my words. Do not show fear. Be brave. And make it clear that they are not welcomed. I'm originally from Mexico. For reasons that will become very obvious, I wish to remain anonymous. I used to be involved in the Mexican cartel. I mainly transported drugs across the border into the United States. To make a long story short, I was caught and cooperated with the feds in exchange for immunity and asylum. Before I go any further, you can go ahead and label me a snitch if you want to. I don't care. I personally feel pretty good about writing out a bunch of drug dealing murderers that work for an organization that is responsible for destroying so many of my fellow Mexicans lives. I was forced into this life at a young age. I've always hated the cartel and was already plotting a way to flee Mexico with my mother and two younger sisters. You could say that it was a good thing that I ended up getting caught. The story is not about how I got out of the cartel. It's about the closest call I ever had during my time with the cartel. This happened during the early days. It was the summer of 2005. I remember the date specifically because I had just turned 18 a day prior. Even though I was barely an adult, I was a very intimidating looking guy. I come from a long line of very physically strong men. I've been lifting weights since I was a child. I'm an even-tempered guy, and I don't consider myself to be an aggressive person, but I will put somebody through the wall if they piss me off. It was because of my physical presence and my piece-of-shit father, who was also in the cartel, made me a target for recruitment. When I first started out, myself and two other guys would drive around Mexico City and collect debts and packages from people who owed money to the cartel or one of our distributors. It was on the fourth or fifth run that we ran into some trouble. There was this particular club we frequented where a lot of business was conducted. To make things simple, an exchange would go down in a back room, and we would come shortly after and collect the revenue and drop it off to our capo. So that night, we entered the club and began making our way to the back room. It was a fairly busy night for the club. This DJ from out of town was performing there, so people from all over were there to see him. 
To get to the back room, we had to go through the main dance floor to the opposite side of the building. There were some renovations that prevented us from using the back entrance. We got out onto the dance floor and started making our way through the crowd. When we were about halfway there, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. It was the barrel of a shotgun being pointed directly at me. I quickly ducked, and not a second later, I heard the gun go off. Unfortunately, an innocent girl who was standing beside me caught the bullet. She was shot at point-blank range, and I don't mean to be insensitive when I say this, but the poor girl's head was blasted apart. I remember several things happening simultaneously after the shotgun went off. All of the partygoers immediately fled the club. From my position on the ground, all I saw was a wave of moving legs. When I stood up, I saw a deserted club, my two co-workers with their guns drawn, cursing up a storm, and, unfortunately, the corpse of the young girl who was just shot. I assumed that the shooter got away in the chaos. We quickly busted into the back office to find another bullet-ridding corpse. It was a club owner, who was our contact. We immediately fled the scene before the police showed up. I was never informed as to what happened with the club owner and who almost took my head off with a shotgun. I was on the lowest rank of the cartel and they kept us in the dark about a lot of things. I'm grateful that I'm no longer a part of that life. I would like to end things by saying a big fuck you to that asshole who tried to kill me and ended up shooting an innocent girl that night. And to all of those cartel members who got locked up because of me, you got what you deserved. And I'll see you in hell. Encounter in a Dark Swedish Forest From Thorn Rose Location, Sweden I'm 21 years old and from a small town in Sweden. Some years ago, me and a couple of guy friends from school decided to go into the forest to camp out for a night. It wasn't the first time we did this, but we had never been to this particular spot before. My friends were Phil and Ned. We had chosen to go camping on a warm and sunny Friday in July. We had our parents drop us off at the entrance to the forest trail. Ned had chosen this spot because he had heard his grandfather speak of it before he passed away not too long ago. There was apparently a camping spot with a fire area, and beyond that there was going to be a small lake. We walked for about an hour on an old gravel road surrounded by thick forest. It took much longer to get there than we anticipated, and being a typical girl, I overpacked. Finally, we made it to the spot, which actually had a small little camping shack with three walls, a roof, and a wooden floor. We walked straight down to the lake after unpacking a bit, then jumped into the water to cool off after such a long and sweaty walk. Phil started a fire while me and Ned carved sticks to grill some hot dogs on. We stayed by the fire all evening and passed around a bottle of vodka that Phil had taken from his parents, and we talked about life and how things were going for us. The sun was beginning to set around that time. Our talking was suddenly stopped when we heard a twig snapping behind us. I froze, not wanting to look behind me. Ned got up and got closer to where the sound had come from and began to laugh nervously. Maybe we got a thirsty rabbit on our hands, he said, as he took a sip from the vodka bottle. He sat back down and we started to relax again, trying to laugh it off. We continued talking a bit longer, until we grew tired. Ned then went to go and relieve himself behind some trees by the shack, and as I stood up from my place to go to my sleeping bag, I heard the sound of someone crying. Petrified. I turned around to look where the sobbing was coming from, and there was another cry. I screamed and ran over to Phil. He was shocked by my reaction because he apparently had not heard the sobbing. Ned came out from the side of the shack and asked what was going on. I explained myself to them as best I could. 
they went silent and began to listen to the forest around them. The sobbing didn't come again, but now we did realize that there were no sounds coming at all from the forest. It was too silent. I was close to freaking out, but the boys tried to explain it away as my imagination and the vodka. We did not want to stay awake anymore, so we threw the last bit of firewood on the fire and got into our sleeping bags on the cold shack floor. I stayed as close to the others as possible. We all had a hard time falling asleep that night, but eventually I did drift off. I then woke up to the sound of Phil whispering in my ear. He said to me, Wake up, there's a girl by the fire. I was too exhausted to understand what he was talking about, but I looked over by the fire anyway. It was dark, and the fire had almost burned out down to ash, and gave the surroundings a faint reddish glow. But I did see a little girl's silhouette, illuminated faintly by the glow past the fireplace, just by the spot I had previously been sitting. I looked over at Ned, but he was fast asleep. Then I looked back at Phil, but he just stared at the girl. She had her head in her hands and was wearing a dirty brown dress. Her hair was long, blonde, and messy, and she herself looked to be no more than three years old. We lay there for what felt like forever before Phil stood up and looked at me, signaling me to do the same. I followed his lead and did as he did. Now Ned woke up and was just about to say something when Phil signed for him to be silent and he pointed to where the little girl stood. The silence was again broken by the sound of sobbing coming from the girl, but she had not moved. A cold chill went through me as I realized that it was the same sounds I had heard in the forest before. I wanted to believe that the little girl was just lost, but I knew deep down in my bones that this was no normal little girl. Phil walked closer to her and tried to talk to her. Hi, my name is Phil. Don't be scared. Are you lost? The little girl stopped sobbing and we waited for her to respond. She lifted her head up slowly. I expected to see a deformed looking face to greet us but she was gorgeous. Until her mouth began to stretch wide open, twice the size of any normal person, and she screamed. I fell backwards and hid my head on the hard, damp floor. I was stunned by the pain and got a splitting headache. When I came to my senses, I was really starting to freak out. But the little girl had disappeared. What the heck was that? I screamed. The boys did not answer me. They were already stuffing their things into their backpacks frantically, screaming that we needed to get out of here. I tried to do the same, but because of the pain in my head, I was not as fast as them. I ended up having to leave some of my stuff behind. But I didn't care, as long as we got out of there fast. We started running down the old gravel road that led to the parking lot. It was pitch dark on that road, which was only lit by the faint light coming from our phones. Ned tripped on something and fell to the ground. We stopped and helped him up to his feet again, but he had hurt his foot on the fall, so we had to slow down. We started to calm down too, thinking that the little girl had not followed us, but we didn't say a word to each other. Phil called his father and begged him to come and pick us up as soon as he could. He was a bit annoyed by being awakened this late, but reluctantly agreed to come. We maybe had 10 minutes left to get to the parking lot when I stupidly looked behind us. I saw the little girl standing there, not even five meters behind us, with her head in her hands. I started crying and the boys did not have to look behind us. I wanted them to know that she was there because the girl began to sob again but louder than before. We tried to go as fast as we could and finally got to the parking lot, but Phil's father was not there yet. We were not going to stay there and wait, so we kept on walking until Phil's father met us by the road and picked us up. 
he drove us back to their house. My mother came soon after Phil's father had called her, and Ned's mother went by to pick us up. I didn't speak about it for a couple of days. My parents were worried, but they didn't press me to talk. I eventually said that we had simply encountered a scary moose that had come into our campsite, and they believed me. They don't believe in strange or supernatural things like ghosts or spirits. But my grandmother did. So I went to her and had her explain to me what she thought it was. She said it was a mealing, a spirit of a child that had perished and was buried without being baptized. Usually the mother of the child had given birth out of wedlock or in secret and ended the child's life soon after. There are apparently a lot of old folk tales about mealings and encounters with them, but usually in old houses where the mothers had buried them under the floorboards. I haven't been back to that forest, and I'm not planning to. The Black Beast of Hell's Canyon From Mr. Smith Anyone who has ever been to the Rockies, and especially anyone who has ever lived there, will tell you that the mountains are colder than they look in all those old cowboy movies. It's a grasping cold that makes your whole body ache, unlike the dull, numbing cold of Michigan or Pennsylvania in the wintertime. And that cloying, gripping cold is precisely what I found myself experiencing on a dark October morning in Idaho not quite two years ago. I've been a pretty avid hunter and outdoorsman for most of my life, and ever since I turned 18 I've been applying for the tag lottery in a few states out west, hoping for a chance to hunt some mountain goat. Finally, after several years of applying, my number came up in Idaho, and I soon received my tag in the mail. Unfortunately, due to a few scheduling conflicts, I couldn't go on my hunt until the last week of October, towards the end of the legal season and well past the mid-weather days of August and September. Now a hunt for mountain goats is one of the most physically demanding and skill-intensive endeavors a hunter can undertake in North America, a true adventure of a lifetime. Even in ideal conditions, you have to hike steep mountains, have a good set of binoculars and sharp eyes, know how to camp efficiently. And of course, you need to be a crack shot. Late in the season, such a hunt becomes even more strenuous due to the shorter hours of daylight and the more hostile weather. Not to mention the fact a lot of local predators are in overdrive, trying to bulk up before the lean winter months. However, I wasn't about to let a little bit of cold wind and snow come between me and one of my ultimate dream hunts. So I immediately began planning. I was worried I'd have to make the cross-country drive, but luckily for me, an old college friend of mine was working as an engineer for a big cobalt mine in eastern Idaho, and he was willing to let me ship most of my gear to him ahead of time. Besides, he had an elk tag that he wanted to fill for the season, so we could camp together and help one another hunt and scout. In the final few weeks leading up to my trip, I began checking the local news from the area I'd be hunting just to keep an eye out for severe weather or other hazards. As a side effect, I got to see all the small town news from western Idaho as well. Most of it was pretty mundane, but one story that caught my eye was the mysterious disappearances of two hunters who were last seen on a swath of public land just southeast of where my buddy and I would be hunting. Of course, people go missing from big state parks and public hunting lands all the time, and they're usually found alive in just a few days, thanks to the hard work of trained professionals. Maybe they strayed too far from the trails and got lost, or maybe they took a tumble in some rocky ground and hurt themselves, typically nothing too out of the ordinary. But occasionally, there are accidents and animal attacks that people don't walk away from, so I always pay attention to stories like that in order to prevent something similar from happening to me. The day of the big trip finally arrived, and after a long flight and an even longer drive, I found myself at a little hotel in a small town called Slate Creek. 
not too far from the huge tract of public land we would go hunting on. My friend arrived less than an hour later. We quickly got settled in before heading down the street to grab some supper at a local diner. We had a good time and caught up over dinner. But at one point, I happened to look up at the TV on the wall, and the headline scrolling across the bottom of the screen ominously read, Missing Hunters Found Slain Near Hell's Canyon, Mountain Lion Attack Suspected. This definitely caught my attention, because a mountain lion won't usually attack more than one person, so there is safety in numbers. However, on the rare occasions that they do attack a group of more than one person, the attacks aren't usually fatal. A couple of fit hikers or a hunting party of grown adults is usually more than capable of forcing even a determined cougar to retreat. This is especially true for two hunters, who would certainly have been armed with rifles and probably would have been toting pistols around and skinning knives as well. Any mountain lion capable of mauling two heavily armed outdoorsmen to death simultaneously was certainly not one I wanted to meet. An adult cougar can have a territorial range of up to 300 square miles, and this put the region of our hunt easily within its patrol range, considering we'd be camped out and hunting right on the edge of Hell's Canyon. However, my buddy and I had talked previously about the possibility of running into predators during the hunt. We had packed accordingly, with him carrying a 10mm automatic and me lugging my 44 Magnum. Even still, we decided to take some extra precautions. To that end, we got up early the next day, and after I had enjoyed what would likely be my last hot shower for a week, we met up at a trading post in town which dealt in all sorts of camping and hunting gear. We picked up a few perimeter bells for our campsite, and we each bought a box of hard cast bullets designed for penetrating thick and muscular hides of predators. They may kick you like a mule, but they certainly don't play around when it comes to stopping power. While in the trading post, we asked the owner, a quiet man of about 50, with salt and pepper hair, and skin weathered from decades of outdoorsmanship, if he had ever seen anything like the cougar attack that had been on the news last night. I was hoping he could give us some advice on protecting our camp, but what we got instead was far more unsettling. I've seen the wilderness out here kill a lot of people in a lot of ways, but it's been a long time since I saw anything as brutal as this. Usually if you find more than one person at a time that's been killed, it was the work of something walking on two legs, not four, if you catch my drift. Every now and then a couple of hikers will walk up on a sow grizzly with cubs, and will find them all mangled up in a week or so but bears always leave clear tracks behind, and it's not the right time of year for them to be raising cubs anyway. No, sir. The last time anything like this happened was about two decades back, when we had a whole rash of weird happenings. Everything from house cats and hens all the way up to prize-winning bulls were found gutted, mauled, chewed on, and otherwise turned into a fine red paste for nigh on a month. It sure put a damper on business around here, I'll tell you that much. The rangers said it was a cougar back then too, but I didn't believe them then any more than I do now. My buddy and I looked at one another, uneasily, before turning back to the store owner and asking, if it wasn't a cougar, then what was it? The man behind the counter simply grinned and continued his tale. Well, after a couple weeks of livestock getting mauled, some local ranchers decided to take matters into their own hands. They went out hunting one night and bagged themselves three of the biggest mountain lions anybody around here had ever seen. And when the rangers examined the cougars, they found that all three of them were related. You see, if a mother puma has more than one kit, she'll teach them all to hunt in the same way at the same time. The rangers were thinking that the mother of those three had brought them up hunting livestock, so that was all they knew. A couple of folks weren't so sure, though. One old-timer that lived up in the hills told stories of a behemoth cat that had been stalking the woods around his cabin, and it wasn't just some mountain lion either. He said it stood taller than even the largest mountain lion, 
and its pelt was black as sin. This man had fought in two wars, but said that this creature scared him stiff, and not two nights later, the worst incident of the whole string happened right here in town. One of the rangers, some rookie who had just moved here from California, was walking back to the ranger station from the diner. Keep in mind, that's a walk of less than 300 yards, and the rest of the rangers at the station never saw him again. They didn't find anything left of that boy the next day, save for a slick of blood and his freshly shined shoes, left at the scene of the attack like he'd been plucked right up out of them. Not long after that, though, a group of rangers was seen sweeping the town and heading off into the wilderness, and from what I've heard, they followed that thing's tracks all the way up to an old silver mine back in the hills. None of the rangers have ever talked much about exactly what they saw up there, but several hikers in the area reported hearing a hail of gunfire right at dusk. Sure enough, the killings and maulings never happened again after that night. But I'll tell you what, if there's another one of those things out there roaming around the wilds now, then you can bet your bottom dollar I won't be sticking around to see how it works out this time around. It was a hell of a story to be sure, and it took me some time to take it in. But it couldn't be true, right? Not all true. I mean, no cat that big and that aggressive could possibly remain hidden on public game land. I told myself. The two of us thanked the man for the info and paid for our ammo and supplies, and after that, we got on our way as quickly as we could. Our time was limited, and listening to the man's story had put us a bit behind schedule. Our last stop on the way out of town was at the ranger station, to check in and inform the rangers of where we'd be and what we would be doing. There was only one officer on duty since it was so late in the season, so I figured we'd probably be able to get through the check-in pretty quickly. But as we answered his questions about our firearms and tags, I thought back to the outfitter's story. I asked the old ranger if there had been any mutilated animals found recently, or if there were any dangerous wildlife in the area that we should be aware of. After all, we would be camping back in the wilderness for close to a full week. The ranger froze for a few moments, and he quietly zipped my .30-06 rifle back into its case before raising his eyes to meet mine. I suppose you heard about those two bodies over at Hell's Canyon. To tell you the truth, there's a lot of nooks and crannies in these hills where something could be hiding, but we've got our best men out there working to keep the place safe. Still, you two should be extra careful out there, and if I were you, I wouldn't split up. I'm really not supposed to do this, but if you've got a notepad handy, I'll give you boys our audio frequency. And you just tell us if you find anything unusual out there. This was way out of the ordinary, since game wardens and rangers never give out their radio frequency. If everyone in the area with a radio could listen in on them, a poacher could have a heyday with all the unsecured information. For the park service to be handing out secure channel information, they must have been truly desperate for as many eyes and ears as possible. To make things even more unsettling, according to the sign-in book, there were only four other hunters in this section of the wilderness. Two individuals and one duo. Of course, there could be others out there that hadn't signed in. An extremely stupid idea in such a large and dangerous wilderness. But this late in the season, I certainly didn't expect the area to be crowded. Even though being so isolated and alone was less than ideal, if there was truly something dangerous roaming the area, I have to admit I was relieved that I wouldn't have to worry about anyone else spooking the game. We finished our check-in at the ranger station by noon, and it was finally time to head back into the wilderness for what would hopefully be the hunt of a lifetime. In fact, it would definitely be a once-in-a-lifetime experience, but not in the way we initially expected. We drove my buddy's pickup as far as we could go along winding gravel roads, well back into the public game lands, and when we finally found a good area to park on the side of the road, 
We packed all our camping supplies into our two huge backpacks, starting to hike even further into the wilderness on foot. After all, if you really want to find where all the record book animals are, you have to go where most hunters won't. All in all, we probably hiked a little over a mile further uphill to get to a good base camp location. We finally got settled into a nice little clearing surrounded by dense forest by about 6 p.m. The sun was just setting over the beautiful Rocky Mountain landscape. We pitched our tents and set up a few lines of string with small bells on them around the edges of the clearing, and then we finally stopped for a simple but filling supper of canned soup cooked over our small camp stove. I was so tired from hiking and so happy to be out in the wilderness on such an adventure that I completely forgot about all the strange rumors and unsettling happenings. The next two days were free of any weird incidents. We scouted the ridgelines and timber thickets, searching for just the right place to set up the perfect shot, and the whole time we never saw anything out of the ordinary. Every now and again, though, we would hear our handheld radios crackle softly, and we would always stop what we were doing and listen close. Most of the time it was just a ranger checking in and giving his location, but more than once the voice on the other side was uneasy, as one of the rangers called in finding a severely mutilated elk or mule deer. What was even more ominous was that if we checked our maps and marked out the locations where mutilated animals had been found, a pattern started to emerge, and it looked like whatever was leaving the mauled animals in its wake could be headed our way. At the end of the third day, we had found the absolute perfect place to lie in wait for a big billy goat. We were planning on getting there early the next morning. We were both bone tired from hiking all day, but as we sat around the warm fire, waiting for our dinner of sausages and hash browns to finish cooking, we both became aware of an approaching sound in the woods beyond the clearing. Both of us were reluctant to leave the warmth of the fire, but finally I made myself stand up and head toward the tree line with my 44 in one hand and a lantern in the other. There was barely a sliver of the waning moon in the sky, so my visibility was limited to how far my lantern could reach in the cold black darkness. The sounds grew closer and closer, and soon the crackle of leaves and branches was accompanied by heavy breathing. I brought my revolver up and pulled the hammer back, bracing myself for some horrible demon cat to come bursting out of the shadows of the woods. Instead, I heard what sounded like a human voice call out from about 50 feet into the tree line. Hello? Anyone there? Relieved, I called back. Yeah, there's a clearing not far in this direction. Just come towards my voice slowly. What are you doing out here this late without a light? A few moments later, a pair of men dressed in camouflage clothes and safety orange toboggans stumbled out of the woods and into the light of my lantern. The two men looked haggard and spooked, but after taking a moment to catch their breath, they introduced themselves. I recognized their names from the sign-in sheet at the ranger station, and they explained that they had followed a wounded elk into the brush and had gotten lost without their flashlights. Being lost in the woods at night is a scary enough concept on its own, but what they told me next sent a real shiver down my spine. They explained that they had shot a fine bull elk from across a gully, and before they could track him through the brush, they had to hike down the side of one mountain and then up the slope of another. By the time they crossed the gulch, found the blood trail, and began tracking the wounded bull, it had been over an hour. They spent another 45 minutes or so following blood splatter and broken branches through the brush. When they finally came to a clearing, they hadn't found exactly the site they'd been expecting. Sure enough, what they found was the carcass of the elk sitting there in the middle of the clearing, but it had been torn apart. Limbs and bones tossed aside, entrails had been torn out and devoured, large hunks of meat still hung on the bones in places, so whatever had been going at it had had its fill with the innards or had simply been mutilating the carcass for fun. Both hunters said they had gotten an extremely uneasy feeling there, 
and they'd been debating on whether or not to try and salvage the rack, when they realized that darkness was beginning to fall. Yeah, so we hightailed it out of there as quick as we could. We must have gotten turned around somewhere in the underbrush, because we certainly didn't end up back where we started. Thank goodness we finally found you two, or we might still have been wandering around till morning. The two of them were clearly exhausted, so we offered to let them share our campsite for the night, throwing a few extra sausages on the griddle. They thanked us, and said they'd be on their way at first light. As we ate, I asked if they could think of any more details that might reveal the identity of whatever had mauled the wounded elk. They said they'd found a few footprints, but in the fading light and the mud and blood from the carcass, they hadn't really been able to tell exactly how large the prints had been, though they both agreed that the tracks looked like those of a mountain lion, or perhaps a bobcat. Moreover, they both reported feeling like they were being watched during their walk through the woods in the dark. We never saw anything, but occasionally we'd hear a rustling in the brush, or we'd catch a quick glimpse of movement out of the corner of our eyes, or all the hairs on the back of our necks would stand up all of a sudden. But we figured it might have just been our heads playing tricks on us in the dark. We talked for a few more minutes as we made our plans for the morning, but soon our exhaustion got the better of us, and we all decided to hit the hay for the night. We doused the fire, and soon we retired to our tents. My buddy would be staying with me in my tent that night, and the other hunters would be sharing his tent. It didn't take long for all of us to fall asleep, since a light snow had begun to fall and our warm quilts and sleeping bags had never seemed more cozy or inviting. At some point during the night, however, I woke up from my peaceful slumber. I'm a pretty light sleeper, so at first I figured my friend had just shifted in his sleep or something. But soon I heard it. The soft tinkling of bells. Something had bumped the small line of bells strung around the perimeter of the campsite. Now at first I assumed it was probably one of the two guests. Maybe one of them had gotten up to use the bathroom out in the trees. And maybe they had bumped the trip line by accident. But then I heard it again, louder this time. It was like someone was playing with the string and bells, swatting and jerking the line to elicit the quiet jingle of the little tin bells. Again and again, the string thrummed from an impact, and the bells tinkled as though they were tossed around on the line. By this point, I was starting to get nervous, and I reached down to the floor of the tent next to my sleeping bag, to find my 44 in its holster. I'm not sure if I made a noise as I moved or if whatever it was just got bored with the line of bells, but as soon as I set up, the jingling stopped, and the night again fell silent, with no noise whatsoever, except for the soft crinkle of falling snow. The next morning we rose early, coming out of our warm cocoons at 3.50. We brewed a quick cup of coffee in the morning darkness, and munched on some trail mix as we got our backpacks ready. However, when we were about to set out for the ridgeline, which we had found the day before, our flashlights caught something menacing pressed into the fresh snow. Coming into the campsite, from the same place where the two hunters had stumbled out of the woods the night before, was a trail of big paw prints. They followed the exact path those two hunters had taken from the edge of the woods to the fire pit, and then they made a large circle around the tent the other two men were sleeping in, before crossing the campsite once more, and ending before the line of bells on the far side of the site, only to continue again about 15 feet further into the woods. It was like something had jumped the bells to exit the clearing, all without making a sound. So, what I did here the night before must have been the thing playing, or rather testing the bells on the way into the campsite. Maybe it was amusing itself with our security measures. Measures it was smart enough to avoid triggering on the way out of the site. Now I was definitely creeped out, and I decided that this, combined with the story of the mutilated elk from the day before, qualified as unusual enough to report to the ranger service. I called it in over the radio giving the sleepy ranger on duty our location, 
and quietly rolling my eyes at his reprimand for using a secure frequency. He said that somebody would be out this way in a few hours, and to just stay put. Of course, if we wanted to be in position on time, we couldn't afford to wait a few hours. We opted instead to just leave a note taped to the inside flap of the other hunter's tent before going on our way. It was a bone-chillingly cold morning to be hiking up and down steep mountain ridges with a heavy pack and a rifle, but I knew there was no other way I'd be bagging a nice goat, so we continued on our way with dogged determination. We finally made it to the base of the ridgeline that we would be setting up on, and we decided to take a brief break before hiking up to the last hill, getting into position. As we were sitting there at the base of the mountain ridge, eating a few more handfuls of trail mix to keep our energy up, we kept catching glimpses of movement out of the corners of our eyes in the lavender light of pre-dawn. It was never anything we could focus on, but every now and again it would seem as if a shadow in the trees would move, or a new shadow would appear where there hadn't been one a moment ago. It was more than enough to set me on edge, and I quietly cycled my rifle's bolt. I put a round into the chamber, just in case. Pretty soon we noticed that the sky was getting brighter, so we decided to go ahead and hike up to the top of the ridge then. We made it about halfway up the steep hill, before my buddy pointed out just how eerily calm the morning was. We hadn't noticed it on the way there due to the strenuous nature of the hike, combined with the fact that it's really not out of the ordinary for everything to be silent in the woods at 4 a.m., on the morning after a snowstorm, no less. However, now that the sun was beginning to light up the sky, small animals should have been out skittering around. Birds should have been flitting from branch to branch as elk bugled in the distance. But there was nothing. Just the occasional plop of a gob of snow falling from a tree branch. We made it to the top of the ridge, and boy, let me tell you, that view alone was worth the early morning trek. Frost glistened on every tree in the valley below, and a serene blue-white carpet of fresh snow covered the opposite peak like icing on a cake. I took it all in for a moment before getting down on my stomach and setting my pack up as a rest for my rifle, as my friend quietly rummaged in his pack for his binoculars. Just then, however, a powerful feeling of being watched came over me, and when I rolled over onto my side to look around... I nearly soiled myself in fright. About 30 yards up the ridge to my right, a pitch-black shape sat perched like a gargoyle on a snow-covered rock. It had the distinct profile of a big cat, but its fur was so dark that I couldn't make out any features of its body, except for the piercing amber-colored eyes that stared right back at me. It was massive, certainly bigger than any mountain lion I'd ever seen. Furthermore, its ears stood straight up, coming to tufted points like a lynx or bobcat. I did not know exactly what it was, but I knew without a doubt that it wasn't there to ask for a cup of sugar. I kicked my buddy lightly with my outstretched leg, and it didn't take him long to spot the predator eyeing us from afar. We were stuck in a standoff, not wanting to make any sudden movements, as the cat just stared at us from its perch. My revolver was strapped on my hip, and while it would have been easier to aim at close range with it, it would be slow and awkward to bring up from my prone position. I heard my friend pull his 10 millimeter out of its holster, but he was in a bad shooting position as well. Instead, my best option would be to turn and fire with my rifle. I flicked the safety off, and its distinctive click sent the cat into a low pouncing position. It began to slink down off its rocky vantage point. I knew it was now or never, and I whispered to my friend, You ready? And he whispered back, Go for it. So I did. As quickly as I could, praying harder than I ever had before, I willed around to bring my rifle to bear, and I'll never forget the sight of making eye contact with that thing through my scope. I fired, the shot echoing across the silent mountain range like the bang of a judge's gavel. I could not see anything except for a blur of movement in my scope, but my friend later told me that I had hit it, just under its massive collarbone. 
he said that he saw a spray of coal black hair come off the beast as it charged. The creature screeched loud enough to wake the dead, and it tumbled, rolling downhill a few yards before getting back to its feet and running off through the snow-covered woods with alarming speed as my friend fired after it with his pistol. We both just sat there for a few moments, collecting ourselves and coming down off the adrenaline high. There was no way we were going to go chasing after that thing, but we also didn't want to stay there on the ridge in case it decided to come back. Besides, our hunt was ruined for the day anyway, as so much gunfire certainly would have scared away any animals in the area. We decided to make our way back to the campsite as soon as we could. Before we left, however, I wanted to have a look at the thing's tracks to see if they matched the ones at our campsite. The paw prints in the snow were enormous, and they were clearly feline. Cats keep their claws retracted as they walk, leaving only the indentations of the pads of their paws. Still, even the largest cougar tracks I've ever seen looked small in comparison to these, and they were pressed deeply into the snow, even penetrating to the mud underneath in some places, indicating that the animal had to have weighed an enormous amount. As I surveyed the tracks, I found a few tufts of oily black fur, but there wasn't a single drop of blood anywhere to be seen, despite the fact that I had nailed it dead center with a 30 6 at less than 20 yards. I was curious for sure, but certainly not curious enough to follow the thing's tracks into the brush, so as soon as we both made sure our handguns were loaded and our holsters were unbuttoned, we got on our way. We made good time heading back downhill, and much to our relief, a little bit of the life seemed to have returned to the forest, with nuthatches chirping and squirrels scampering through the fresh snow. We had made it about two-thirds of the way back towards our campsite, when we encountered two men in rangers' uniforms coming up the trail in the opposite direction. They were armed to the teeth, with one toting a black tactical shotgun and the other carrying a semi-automatic rifle. They both had body armor over their green uniforms, with plenty of extra ammunition practically dripping off of them. They asked us if the camp just down the trail was ours, and when we said yes, they both breathed a sigh of relief, saying that they had heard our flurry of gunfire earlier and had assumed the worst. We continued hiking hurriedly back towards the campsite, and as we walked, we told the two rangers what happened. When we described the animal to them, however, they both shot one another a dour look before saying, Yeah, you boys sure are lucky to have survived a cougar attack like that. My friend and I looked at one another in stunned silence for a moment, and asked them if they had even been listening to our description. I've seen cougars, heck I've hunted cougars, and I've been hunted by cougars. This thing was not a damn cougar, I said, frustratedly. The rangers looked at me sympathetically for a moment before continuing to hike in silence, but by then we were nearly to the campsite. Although when we emerged from the trees at the edge of the clearing, it looked much different than when we had left it a few hours ago. The whole clearing was crawling with people. Some were rangers decked out in tactical gear, like the two that had come to meet us, and others were rangers in regular uniforms. Some were dressed in the blue and gold uniforms of local police, too. Cameras flashed left and right in the woods beyond the clearing, and our tents had both been neatly packed and placed in an organized pile, along with our cooler and a few other things at one edge of the campsite. The other two hunters from the night before were nowhere to be seen. Our jaws hung open in disbelief, and soon enough, a tall man in a clean and well-fitted ranger's uniform approached us, telling us that he believed it was in our best interest to pack up and leave the area as quickly as possible. We did agree that the campsite didn't feel safe anymore, but when we asked to simply relocate our camp to another section of the game reserve, his expression turned dark, and he retorted with, I asked you boys to leave. Now you're going to cooperate, right? I looked at my friend again, and he simply shrugged, unsure of what other options we really had. After a few seconds, I simply gave in and said, You got it, chief. I'll head to the truck, before grabbing one of my tents and slinging it over my shoulder. When we reached the state road where my buddy had parked the truck, 
There must have been at least 15 or 20 other vehicles there, lining the shoulder of the small gravel road in both directions. We packed the truck, and we returned to town in silence. Once we were back to civilization, I checked back into the small inn we had stayed at on our first night in town. It would have been cheaper to stay there for the next few days than to reschedule my flight last minute. My buddy left for home on the other end of the state the next morning, and we never said another word about the bizarre experience. I spent the next three days quietly milling around town. One evening, while I was back at the local diner, I caught a snippet of local news broadcast featuring an interview with the same steely-eyed ranger that had told us to leave the reserve. Following the interview, there were a few snapshots of men in rangers' uniforms posing with the carcass of a moderately-sized cougar, and the headline on screen emphatically stated, Cougar Behind Hunter Deaths Trapped by Local Rangers. I finally returned home, albeit empty-handed, and I soon got back to my daily routine of work. However, less than a month later, a mysterious envelope with no return address arrived in the mail, and when I opened it, there was a full set of Idaho hunting tags with next year's season dates stamped on them. Everything was there. Mule deer, elk, black bear, even mountain goat, all pre-approved and stamped with my name. Underneath the set of tags, there was a folded piece of stationery marked with the Forestry Service logo, which bore the handwritten words, Every year, say nothing. I haven't been back out west since, but I'm considering going back this year. This time, instead of my hunting gear, I think I'll bring a camera. <laughs>